You're listening to a 4x4 Radio Network podcast. This month's Center Steer podcast is sponsored by Commonwealth Classics. Commonwealth Classics is a direct importer of classic vehicles from Europe and South America and has a rotating collection of rare and unique Land Rovers. Their showroom is located in Virginia, just 45 minutes from Washington, D.C. Visit www.cwclassics.com to view their current inventory of classic vehicles. This episode is also brought to you by LT Wright Knives. These heirloom quality pieces will outlast your adventures, so plan well, drive safely, and carry an LTWK. Find out more online at ltwrightknives.com. The Center Steer Podcast, a Land Rover podcast by Land Rover owners. Welcome to the Center Steer Podcast, the first Land Rover podcast on the planet. Center Steer is a podcast by, for, and about Land Rover owners. This is show number 72 for March 2019, and we're recording on March 31st. I'm your host, uh, John Costage. Joining me via Skype is Harold and Morgan. How you guys doing? Hey, doing well. Good, good. And also, our guest this month is also joining us for the show is Dixon Kenner. Dixon is a member of OVLR and helps to manage the LRO LRO, a mailing list, which is a great resource for series truck owners. We'll learn about it in a great event called the Birthday Party later in the podcast. But in the meantime, welcome to joining us, Dixon. Good day. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, and you are currently traveling in your uh, Audi, and you're traveling back from, from helping on a what a Rover Fix weekend, right? 80-inch weekend down in New Jersey, so most of it was working on a 1957 uh, 88. Yeah, we'll learn more about that later in the show when we talk to Dixon, uh, and also on a better connection. We talked to him a couple days ago, and it was uh, over a better Skype connection, but he wanted to join us for the news here. I guess it's kind of a tryout to see if he'll join us as a panelist, right? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> mm, an audition. Yes, there we go. An audition. There we go. <laughs> so, so you're having an 88-inch weekend of bonus content. Well, we also moved the mobile engine shunt off of uh, Ben's 1951 over to my 1951 so we can continue moving uh, engines from one barn to the other. His engine was having a bit of a challenge running, and with the, a crane hanging off the front of a Land Rover, it makes it difficult to open the bonnet and get at anything, so we just switched everything over also. Got it. So there was an 80-inch 80 80 inch content. Okay. And I realize that with Dixon being on Skype while driving, the, the audio levels will be a little different, so apologize ahead of time for that. But again, when you get to hit with the interview, it's not like that. The levels will be the similar, which is... You know, our number one number one concern is getting all so, the audio. So please don't quit too early. Exactly. And it's the spring here in western Pennsylvania. It's a great opportunity yeah, sort of. to clear the critters out of your truck, put new tires on it, and get out on the trail. I'm asking that for a friend. I didn't tell you about this yet, Harold. I opened up the 109, <laughs> and a critter had uh, made a little home in the front dash. Oh, lovely. Yeah, I didn't clear it out yet because I, was, I wasn't prepared. I got to go get some gloves and whatnot. Find out what all it ate. That was my concern too. It's it's in the cubby between the the cluster and the uh, center con center stack there. So. so so mostly it's your stuff at eight, not mine. So uh, yeah, I don't think there's <laughs> m much in there, so which is good. Hopefully you don't have too much new wiring in there. They <laughs> love new wiring. Yeah. Well, that's where the uh, backup camera is, or the backup you know, camera screen is. So it was right next to it, anyways. I hopefully he didn't get in there. We'll yeah, find. Yeah, if out. he gets behind that screen, I'm I'm not going to be happy. Yeah, exactly. Uh, thanks for your comments. Follow us, likes uh, on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and emails. And thanks everyone for their support through Patreon donations and merchandise sales. I've taken some of that money and have purchased a new mixer. It's good that is dedicated to for podcasting. It's a what's it called, uh, Morgan? Was it Roadcaster? I think it's called. Yeah, I think it's called the Roadcaster, Roadcaster Pro. Roadcaster Pro. It looks really cool. It's gotten a lot of good reviews, and it should maybe. Uh, I'm hoping. How about this? I'm hoping for what it seems like. It seems like it should help make producing the podcast a little easier and maybe a little quicker. The nice thing is it's kind of oriented towards the non audio engineer which currently a lot of the all those all the mixers that are out there when you're, when you're doing, which is what I'm using right now have you know your microphones come in and then the audio goes out and you have to le learn about mix minus and apparently this all handles all that stuff uh, for you so it's kind of like a uh, 
uh, modern Defender compared to the old Defender, right? It kind of does it for you. I guess we'll find out. <laughs> uh, exactly. Yes, all will be revealed. <laughs> if you wish to support the show, you can go out to patreon.com slash center steer. All the details on becoming a Patreon supporter yourself. And thanks to our Patreon uh, supporters and listeners. And Rover Tour is donating $80 to the podcast for the purchase of his Rover Range Rover Classic winch trays. Trays are $480 American plus shipping. And there will be a, there's a link to that in uh, the show notes. If you're in the market for a Range Rover Classic winch tray, you, you can help out Abel and also help out the podcast too. Thanks to Abel, of course, for his generosity. I'm planning to use that money still towards uh, getting a new microphone here in the studio. But I thought when the new podcast mixer came up, I thought that was a better call than maybe the the microphone right now. And uh, Alex in Barbados, we heard from him again, so I will read you his email. Hi, John, Mor uh, Morgan, and Harold. Thanks for the shout-out on episode 71. I cheated and skipped ahead just this once. You mentioned uh, me being a glutton for punishment, but the disease has taken full hold of me now, so much that I'm going to pick up these two for free this week. He sent pictures of series trucks. I can't bear to see them end up on the dump, and, bes and besides, I plan to build a standard series model anyway as a future project. Not completely sure if the yellow one is a 2A, but I think it might be based on uh, on the rotted bulkhead. <laughs> Rotten bulkhead. <laughs> the green one is almost certainly a 3, uh, but could be a rogue 2A and defender parts. No engine, no engines in either, but it's possible I'll put one of these onto either a shortened defender or disco uh, one chassis and respective engine coil springs, depending on which model uh, gets chosen. Could be the ultimate series. At the very least, I'm getting some original front and tail lights that I, I can add to my lightweight. My daughter broke one of the original glass ones that was on the lightweight, so this takes away some of the pain away. <laughs> Again, Does she still live with you? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, again, thanks. I'll get onto the site and see what stuff I can find to get my hands on from your shop. All the best, Alex. So it's good to hear from Alex. <laughs> Hopefully your daughter's fine, right? Daughter comes first, Harold. Daughter first, then Lynn. All right. All right. I'm sure it was an accident. She was probably looking at it. Probably for her was a cool thing to look at. Well, of course it's a cool thing to look at. And I uh, reached out to Simon from the Green Oval podcast, and uh, Simon responded, because I hadn't heard from a show in a long time, was curious what was going on, and he said, Simon says, we've taken a break, but planning on Series 2 in the next month or so, think we are going to do a fixed number of episodes in a series, that way we're not forced to do, do it monthly, which was becoming a challenge. Really? Pod it's hard to do these <laughs> once a month? <laughs> forced. Really? Where, where does he get that idea from? Where? Where? <laughs> Why would you say that? <laughs> Only starting, what, a whole almost an hour late from when we originally planned to start because there were so many stories this month. Before we get into the news, I'm going to head down. Hopefully this uh, show should come out this week before the Rover at Wintergreen, which is a, an event that the Rove folks put on. I'm going to head down to Wintergreen this upcoming weekend. And then the weekend after is the Sand Rover Rally in Santa Rosa Beach, Florida, and I'm planning to head on down there. I will have stickers and I will have shirts if you wish to help support the show. Uh, you can do that. You want to chat, you want to talk, be wonderful, and maybe uh, find some new uh, new guests to have on in future shows. Look for us at those two events upcoming. And now, let's start with the news. So first up... Despite strong North American and UK sales, China continues to affect JLR sales. So JLR retail sales in February 2019 were 38,000 plus vehicles, which was down 4% compared to February of last year. Uh, strong sales of the I-Pace, E-Pace, and refreshed Range Rover and Ro Range Rover Sport were upset, offset by overall weak customer demand in China as well as the run out of the old Range Rover Evoque, with sales of the all-new Evoque expected to ramp up over the coming months. So to give you the uh, overall numbers here, retail sales were up significantly in North America, 25%, UK up 11%, and modestly higher in Europe, 1.1%. But weaker market conditions continue to weigh in on sales in China, down 47%. <laughs> well, that's a, just a little bit of a dip. Jeez. Indeed it was. It has been very dire in the last month or two, but I think it continues to be somewhat dire. But as you know, Land Rover is trying to, uh, JLR is trying to adjust and, and do some cost savings, which we'll talk about here in a minute. But it's not, but it, it's good to balance that with the U.S. is doing well, U.K. is doing well, Europe is kind of on hold. Yeah, we're doing our part. So following along from that, JLR's owner wants someone else to help fix the business. So this article 
and story came out early in March, and there was like a little flurry of activity. Then it seemed to disappear. So I think that I think it might have been a trial balloon. Here's some uh, just a couple lines from Jalopnik. With Brexit threatening supply lines, China's reversing growth, a lineup of old sedans, and a hefty price tag on new electric vehicle development, Tata Motors is reportedly looking to sell a bit of JLR. Tata Group, the company that bought JLR from Ford back in 08, is looking to either turn JLR into a joint venture or sell a chunk of it, according to Bloomberg. Then they discussed the Bloomberg article, but I'll just continue on here with, but Tata isn't very interested in ceding control of JLR to any other parties, according to Bloomberg sources, but it is open to anyone that wants to throw them some fresh equity. Representatives from JLR declined to comment on Bloomberg's story, but a Tata spokesperson told Bloomberg that, quote, there is no truth to the rumors that Tata Motors is looking to divest its stake in JLR. We would not like to comment further on any other on any market speculation. Unquote. Well, that's actually more than not commenting. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I think uh, another I reason mean, why I think tr- I think trial balloon. That, that's that's what I kind of heard. Like, what would you guys think if we maybe you know? Yeah, I think you toss it out there, kind of on the sly, you know, unofficially might be shopping and see what the response is and go from there. But if it doesn't go anywhere, then you could come back later in public to deny that you ever thought that. And it sounds like that's what they're doing. Makes what? sense, especially since it sounded like they didn't want to give up any control. They just wanted some extra cash. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. I, I would think if you wanted extra cash, you'd be doing this when sales are doing well and from a position of strength, not a position of weakness. Right. And if I had, you know, ton of money that wanting China wanting to keep an equity control of this thing would be disturbing to me you know joint venture where I have a say in the matter certainly but if this is all about you going and me bailing you out well you're you're limiting your options there very quickly agreed probably a good reason to deny it immediately question that came up to me was everything we heard before was that Tata was in a position of strength and then, like, quickly, everything, see, like, in a month, just like this whole situation with, with JLR seems to have turned on a dime, where everything was great, 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 and then it wasn't, and it was really bad. It seems very similar with with the, with the Tata, the, the home company itself, was, oh, yeah, we're fine. Everything's going great. We support, we support, we support. And then all of a sudden, everything, again, turns on a dime. You're like, well, maybe we could have some investors, or we don't have as much money as we thought we did. I just find it very interesting that, that it was it reminds me of uh, hockey and hockey players where they they get a they get an injury and then they just say upper body they don't tell you where specific part you know on the body it is and it almost seems very similar just kind of a little bit of a cover up but understandably kind of a cover up well you got to keep in mind that Tata has a lot of other business groups and if one of those like for instance their steel industry has a downturn and then that can affect what resources they have to do all their other things yeah and with with China dropping nearly 50%, isn't that still one of their biggest markets? That is yeah, I think so. The biggest, yes. That's very quick change. It is the biggest car market for not only Land Rover, but for everybody. It's the biggest car market now China is. Uh, moving on, uh, JLR Global Executive Joe Eberhardt has a plan to make profits. And this is a, an, an interview with CNBC here in the United States. So I'm going to read you the question, and then I'll read you his answer. And there's a, there's a good number of them, and I'm going to, we're probably going to go through all of them, or pretty almost all of them, because I thought the answers and the questions were you know, relevant to our interest here. I'll re- here's the introduction, though. The transformation has been a lot tougher for other, for the other half of JLR, which is owned by Tata, we know, but best known for sleek cars, sleek sport cars, and sport sedans like the. Uh, F-Type and the XJ, Jaguar has been struggling to adapt to changing market conditions, resulting in a loss of 281 million pounds, or $372 million, for JLR during the most recent quarter. The good news is that after years of delay, Jaguar has uh, three utility vehicles in its fleet, and they're generating a surge in demand. CNBC recently sat down with Joe Eberhardt, one of JLR's senior global executives and CEO of its North American operations, to discuss the company's plans. First question. Your bottom line did not look very good during the fourth quarter of 2018. What went wrong? Eberhardt. It's the result of serious headwinds like the rest of the industry. The China business has slowed down for everyone. Meanwhile, a lot of our business is dependent on diesel, which is slowing down in Europe. I don't want to say the speed of change took us by surprise, but but they were too quick for us to react to immediately. 
It takes time to transform ourselves to the point where we can be profitable again. End of answer. I just thought it was interesting how, like, no, we didn't, we didn't anticipate these problems. They came at us quickly. <laughs> we didn't react fast enough. I, I just, I, I wasn't too sure that China was also down for everyone. Was it, or was it just, was it just Land Rover? I'm trying to remember the articles in the past. I, I think don't. it's been down for for most everybody, but maybe JLR more than others. Yeah, that, that, I guess that rings a bell. All right, next question. How are you planning to do that? We'll put two tra uh, transformation programs in place. In the short term is one called Charge that is purely focused on cost reductions. The other is called Accelerate, which is meant to address some of the systemic issues we're facing from a market perspective. Both efforts together will generate 2.5 billion euros, $2.8 billion in profit improvement, and we think we'll have a sustainable business. And we think we'll have a sustainable business. Charge should have been renamed to regen <laughs> how about break <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> I, I think we need to spend less time coming up with cute names for their programs and just spend more time on the programs that's a lot of money though how you look at it slowing down and accelerating in certain places that's still that's a that's a lot of money i wonder where, where it's all coming from which we've talked about in the past still kind of a staggering number so CNBC, uh, Land, Land Rover seems well positioned to respond to the surge of SUV demand. Not so with Jaguar, however. Eberhardt, the shift to SUV continues. We're now at 70% SUVs for three consecutive months in the U.S., which nobody would have expected. I think that's, I think he means sales there. And the trend is moving in the same direction in the rest of the world. It's hard to say where that will end. When it was 50%, I thought it would be the end. I don't think we knew how quickly that trend would happen when we did the F-Pace, E-Pace, and I-Pace, so I guess you could call it luck. I can guarantee at the time, nobody said it would be 70% at planning meetings. The good news is that we have the product. The question is now how we react on the downside with cars that are not in demand. I bet they did not think that they were going to have percentages like that. Yeah, you're probably right. But it's interesting, too, that around the same time, you know, is when all the other industries, all the other manufacturers were thinking about reducing their car manufacturing and production. You know, Ford has cut it out here in the U.S. except for one. And sorry, Harold, Jaguar is, is, is going towards SUVs. Well, my opinion has been well documented in the past, so I feel no reason to add to that. I, 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 yes, I admit to some some poking at the bear there. No, so I would tend to agree with Harold because when I think of Jaguar, I think of sports cars, and I look at Porsche. They're still producing the 911, even though they're getting into SUVs at the same time. If right, Jaguar but... goes down the SUV road, who's going to buy it? Especially with some of the reliability issues. Well, in that that part aside, Jeff Aronson likes to throw the Porsche example out there all the time because the you know they had to do that to survive. But Jaguar has a sister division that does SUVs, so it seems to me you're biting your sister's hand by competing with them. Exactly, you can, you can specialize to a certain extent. And generally, when you have one company, it's fine to cannibalize from your own sales for something that's going to generally improve things, but. Between Jaguar and Land Rover, that's just purely cannibalizing sales, it seems like. It doesn't seem like there's a benefit there. I disagree with you guys. I, I, it, if it wasn't for having that, that stable mate, uh, I think Jaguar would be further behind because they were able to quickly gather that SUV knowledge just like what BMW did when they right. bought uh, Land Rover. At the expense of Range Rover sales. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And well, but then, of course, they knew what they were. They purposely did that. Uh, but I think here it's a little different because the, the it's a different I think it's a different kind of customer and, and slightly uh, different way the cars are set up. You know, there's they are setting up the Jaguars to be a little more uh, interesting to drive, whereas the Land Rovers are not. I think it's a still think it's a different market. I, I, I there might be some cannibalization, but I don't think as much as uh, I think as uh, you guys think there is. It's, it's a strategic decision the company's making, and it'll be interesting to know some of their thought processes behind it. Speaking of which, why don't we continue? Uh, CNBC, do you have to start thinking about dropping some of your Jaguar passenger cars? Everhart, we haven't yet. Despite their low volume, we think there's still significant demand for cars. 30% of the market is still a huge number, but there might come a, there, but there might come a point it's like manual transmissions. There's no demand, so we have to exit the market. Another area is the sport brake or wagon. The market doesn't take to it. And diesel will be an uh, interesting market to watch. It continues to sell well on Range Rover and Range Rover Sport, but we have to watch it. 
So a long answer to your question, if three years from now that 70% becomes 85%, we have to ask, we have to ask which mark, which products make sense anymore. So I, to your guys' point, if you want to see Jaguar continue to make cars, you need to actually buy Jaguar cars. CNBC. Do you need more SUVs and crossovers? Everhart, there's always something under development, but nothing I can talk about. You shouldn't think that uh, JLR isn't working on new products. We always are, but I don't know if we need more models. We have a broad spectrum of derivatives, engines, and price points, and we have a huge portfolio on the Land Rover side that is getting even bigger. I want to make sure that we don't step on ourselves. We all we have to we have to have clearly defined and delineated products on the Jaguar and Land Rover sides that speak to the core value of each brand. I agree wholeheartedly. I think it's getting a little too watered down on the Land Rover side. Well, certainly on the Range Rover side. Oh well, yeah, that's that's becoming a third brand. CNBC. In terms of self-driving vehicles, you've teamed up with Waymo, the Google spinoff. We'll buy as many as 20,000 iPace SUVs uh, for its autonomous ride-sharing service. What does this mean for your own plans for autonomy, Eberhardt? Waymo is a great opportunity for us to get into the space with probably the best partner in the business. That doesn't mean this will be our only application. We want to hedge our bets. We want to develop our own autonomous applications. If you asked me a year ago, I wouldn't have been so confident. I've driven in autonomous vehicles with Waymo, and I must say they work better than humans. I can think the consumer adaptation might be great. Uh, when I'm out for dinner, it frustrates me. I can't drink more than one glass of wine and drive. There are times when I want to have four or five glasses. At this point, I want to be able to hit a button on the on the, the car I drove to the restaurant and have it drive me home. The biggest issue in our societal acceptance of that technology, we are we're nowhere near ready. So that was a good summation of what I've heard about uh, self-driving cars, and which is nice to see. He kind of, I think, agrees, at least agrees with me on that. And next, uh, every senior executive I know in the auto industry has something that keeps them awake at night. How about you, Eberhardt? We always, uh, what keeps me awake are the challenges we face that could be exacerbated by things out of our control. We lived through shifts in market demand before, but there are unknowns on the tr on the trade side that you can't plan for, like Brexit. Dependent upon what steps, what next steps will be, the implications will be significant and far-reaching for us. If there's a no-deal Brexit, the profit implications could be significant for us beyond one billion pounds. So we are already in a challenging situation, facing a market headwinds and structural headwinds. Uh, and you put uh, and you put on top of that the key political unknowns that could potentially make the situation worse. Okay. And then what about President Trump's uh, threat to put uh, tariffs on auto imports? Uh, and Everhart said, we're not sure what will happen with that. Nobody knows what will happen if cars should be seen as a threat to national security. I, just, I like that line, a little subtle dig there. Yeah, that is just, yeah. It, it would be funny if it wasn't so stupid. Yeah. Uh, but the 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 threat of losing a billion pounds of, of, due to a, a no-deal Brexit, I think it's, uh, that's also a lot of money. <laughs> So, well, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, if and especially sure. if they're trying to save and you know and and turn themselves around, and they're talking what two point eight, two and a half billion, if I remember correctly. Well, they do have a big Slovakian factory to go and move production to if Brexit comes to be with a No Deal version. And there is a lo there's a lot of uh, capacity there at that Slovakia plant. And finally, CNBC. One last question. What is it with JLR and its fixation with long model names? You recently launched your most expensive product yet, but also one that can hit uh, hit 60 in the time it takes to say its name. <laughs> Eberhardt, let's see. It's the Land Rover, Range Rover, Velar, SV, Autobiography, Dynamic. Dynamic Edition, interjects JLR's head of uh, PR. Yeah, Dynamic Edition. That makes, <laughs> that makes, they make me say it all. <laughs> I just absolutely love that even he couldn't get through the whole name. Oh, yeah. Right. And the PR person probably had a piece of paper there looking at it to make sure he said all the things. But on the other side of that, I also don't want to see them go to calling, uh, adding numbers and, and simple letters like every other mark has gone to. I still like a name in, in, my, in the vehicle. You know, Cadillac is now CT and AT. And so I, I still like that the, the, there's a name in there. And I still prefer that it's still the Land Rover Range Rover. <laughs> I'm glad they haven't separated that out. Oh, no, it's the Land yeah. Rover, Range Rover, Velar. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I kind of <laughs> like that, you know, the seven, back in the 70s, you know, people people understood the distinction anyway, but it was just the Range Rover, not the, you know, not the Land Rover, Range Rover. It, it was a Land Rover or it was a Range Rover. And, and I, I like that part of it. 
That's true. So it was made by British Leyland at the time. Well, yeah, and 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 Rover Cars was still a, a, an entity. So it was, you know, it was basically it was a type of Rover. And and that thought has actually continues here in the U.S. because I still get friends who say, oh, you know, are you bringing your Range Rover? And where's your Range Rover? And I'm like, no, it's a Land Rover. And, you know, make that make that distinction to them. So that somehow that thinking has pervaded after all this time. Yeah, and I just don't get how you confuse a, a bashed up 109 for a Range Rover. <laughs> it's better than confusing it with a Jeep. hey <laughs> Or a Hummer. It's true. <laughs> my, my meat wagon has been called a Hummer. So, some old coot shuffled past and said he drove Hummers just like that in Vietnam. That is wrong on so many levels. Well, uh, I may, maybe to his credit, it was more like you know people using Jeep in a generic fashion. How about that, Harold? Does that make you feel a little better? Mm, well, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on in news, JLR postpones involvement in major Coventry scheme. So JLR has postponed its involvement in a multi-million dollar pound technology park in Coventry, which is expected to create 6,000 jobs. It was a 60-acre site dubbed Whitley South. It was a partnership between JLR and Coventry City Council. The usual unprecedented challenges, external headwinds, so they are postponing. They didn't, they're not canceling, but they're postponing. JLR was set to occupy a large portion of the site, which sits next to its Whitley headquarters as part of its aim of establishing Coventry as its global research and development base. The plan was for the rest of the site to be occupied by third parties, including some of JLR suppliers. That's been postponed, and I think we know why. Yeah, it's part of their charge stage. Yes, that's right. <laughs> accelerate, accelerate. Oh no, no char. Or, or oh no, break, break. That's yes. Yeah, break, <laughs> break makes more break. sense. Yes, I will read you the headline, and that is all I know the story because I refuse to to pay for agency spies subscription. JLR agency Spark Forty Four to close LA office and consolidate operations in New York. I think that's part of charge, right? Or break. Well, except that, as far as I understand it, it's just an ad agency that Land Rover hired out there marketing too. Yeah, they made a big deal about opening up another office in in the Silicon Valley to or or in that or at least in California. Yeah. So I guess that costs too much money so they're not doing it. I suppose. Uh, JLR wins case in China against Evoke Copycat. So JLR won a legal victory in compensation after a court in China ruled that the Jingling Motors Landwin X7 SUV was too similar to the Range Rover Evoke. The Beijing District Court agreed with JLR that the Landwin copied five unique features of the Evoke, which led to widespread consumer confusion. The court ruled that the Landwin, that Landwin, must pay JLR compensation. The ruling refers to the original Landwin X7 from 2014 rather than the most recent facelifted model, which toned down some of the more blatant similarities. <laughs> and it, it was pretty much identical in 2014. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's like they splashed a mold off, of, off the Evoke and just started making them. Oh, yeah, yeah. If you can see that they have a picture of it here. It's If you didn't look and see Landwin on the front, you wouldn't notice. Well, you can buy a stick on letters to say anything you want. It doesn't change what it is. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Two stories in the giveth and taketh away, or taketh away and then giveth. JLR recalls 44,000 cars over CO2 emission levels. They have initiated a voluntary recall of around 44,000 cars in the UK over higher than certified levels of carbon dioxide emissions. We'll contact the owners, of course, free of charge repairs. Uh, found 10 models were emitting more of the greenhouse gas than had been certified to admit. Pairs could include software updates as well as physical alterations, uh, with some of the Evoke models requiring new tires. The recall will affect versions of the Discovery, Discovery Sport, Range Rover Sport, Velar, and Evoke, made between 2016 and 2019. Jaguar models include E-Pace, F-Pace, F-Type, XE, XF, while most models run on petrol some diesel models are also part of the recall so, so so the evokes are being recalled for their tires what is it because they emit too much when they're doing donuts i i that's the repairs <laughs> that's the repairs may include new tires would that be so they get a little better gas mileage maybe i'm i'm yeah. guessing yeah, yeah probably rolling resistance <laughs> yeah probably harder tires or something like that yeah le less less effective tires 
Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, indeed. But on the give us side, and I'm going to read all this article because I thought it was really interesting. You guys might not find it, but uh, I find it interesting. JLR diesels well below emission levels. New tests fine. Tests have been carried out on the, by the newly launched AIR, AIR index, an online database developed by the Global Alliance of Academics and Industry Experts. It uses independently sourced test data to rank vehicles from A to E, dirtiest to cleanest, based on their NOx emit emissions on on-road driving. Results are now out for the E-Pace, the Discovery Sport, and the full Discovery, and the outgoing Range Rover Evoque, which uh, Land Rover supplied uh, on their own. And they have been rated in the cleanest A category in real-world urban testing carried out for the database. Every car rated by, on the Air Index is based on at least two independently sourced cars over three separate tests, including at least five 10-kilometer trips, conducted on paved roads using onboard testing equipment. The test figures show that all four models are not only beating on road emission limits, but even the laboratory ones. Official NOx limits for diesels are set at 80 milligrams per kilometer. Is MG milligram, right? Yes. Under Euro yes. 6. The RD, uh, RDE1 on-road test allows vehicles to emit 2.1 times more pollutants on the road and becomes mandatory for all new cars from September 2019, while RDE limits are uh, limits this to 1.5 times from January 2021 for all new cars. And so the NOx limits uh, for diesels are set at 80 milligrams per kilometer. I just remind you of that. The results for the E-PACE are 14 milligrams, the uh, Discovery Sport 34 milligrams, and the Evoke at 17 uh, milligrams, and the Discovery, full-size Discovery, at 33 milligrams. And re I remind you that the NOx limits are 80. Interesting that they score so well on the NOx, and yet they're being recalled for their CO emissions. <laughs> well, these are diesels, <laughs> and the other ones were petrol, just to be clear. Okay. But yes, right. they okay. were mostly they were mostly petrol, but 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 yes. they were different. It was a different pollutant, and that's that's Correct. you know the key point there is that I mean it's it's one thing to control one kind of emission, but you have to control all of all them, the and that's where the challenge is. Mm -hmm. uh, well, and diesels emit less CO two anyway. Inherently, they do, yes. I think it's going to be interesting because diesels really are more of a future than petrol engines in terms of the emissions and so on that they give. And also, I think diesels are going to be around a lot longer than people think because there's only so much cobalt and ability to make batteries for all of these fleets of electric vehicles that they seem to believe are going to be on the roads in the near future. Right. And diesel is a lot cleaner than it gets a reputation for. But because there have been some some bad politics and bad press, it, it's, you know, they're being blasted as being so dirty. And they're really not. Well, if diesel was that bad, you wouldn't be using diesel engines in, down in mines and not letting petrol engines anywhere near them. Right. Conclude this uh, article just because I, I found this a little, little uh, an interesting comment. And this is from the uh, Allow Independent Road Testing Air, uh, the co-founder here and operations director. He said the perfect example, talking about how low the NOx limits were, uh, emissions were from the Land Rovers, the perfect example is a Land Rover Discovery, which produced NOx emissions 20 times lower than a diesel Renault Clio Super Mini. <laughs> I saw another headline where it, you know, Land Rover beats, you know, the Land Rover Clio. So just a nice comparison. That's all. Well, yeah, yeah, because the Disco is what five times the size of the Renault. Oh, probably, yeah, yeah, exactly. And it can actually do important things and cost for important people. For important people and cost more. Well, yeah, but it, you know, it's it's worth owning as opposed to the other. Jaguar J Pace coming in 2021 on platform shared with the next Range Rover. So the uh, JLR is working on a, a so-called J-Pace to target the BMW X5 and Mercedes GLE in the midsize luxury SUV segment. And the vehicle's due in 2021. And uh, I think this is uh, news. I just bring it up because the J-Pace, which should boast third row seats, is said to utilize a new modular platform shared with the next generation Range Rover and Range Rover Sport which is due around 2021. I think is that the that's the MLA. Yeah, that's that MLA uh, platform. Is that the same one that the Defender will use or no? That's still the other platform. No, I think there I think all of them are moving aren't all of them moving to the uh, MLA from what is it PLA? Is that is that right? Well, I, everything except for the uh, the hybrids and the transverse engine models because the MLA the L is longitudinal. Okay. Oh, right. 
So the anything MLAs. with a long, oh no no anything with a longitudinal engine is going to be going towards the MLA. Hang on, Harold. Uh, just because I was I didn't highlight this originally, but looking further in the article, dubbed MLA, the platform debuts this year in the highly anticipated modern Defender and will eventually underpin all models at JLR. Jaguar vehicles will be more road biased to help differentiate them from the rugged Land Rover. One of the main benefits of the MLA platform will be its ability to support hybrid and full electric drivetrains. The J Pace will take advantage of this by launching. A plug-in hybrid, blah 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 blah. Okay. So I, I, yeah, this is from motor. So they're running longitudinal even on their electric stuff. That's interesting. That's yeah. different. You know, I think when we read this the first time, Harold, I think there was a transition period, and maybe that's what they're referring to here. I seem to recall. I think you were you're right, but I think that might be for now. And I think eventually okay. the idea is that that MLA will do every will will handle all, if I remember correctly. Well, deproliferating is usually a good way to save money. There was a lot of def new Defender news, or a little, but the, the big thing was we actually had video of a new Defender moving, and uh, there's actually two of them. But I will start with a Land Rover exec drop hints, drops, drop, drops, singular, right. Land Rover exec drop hints on new Defender. Like I said, drop is singular there. This was, uh, is this Eberhardt again, or is this somebody else? I clicked off the wrong article. Yes, it was. In fact, it was Everhart yet again. He talked to Trucks.com, and I'm looking at uh, Rover Parts, which is Atlantic British's kind of coverage of it, so we'll, we'll look at that. Interrupt me as you, as you want. I'm, I'll just start reading, see what they say, and then we'll go from there. So in an interview with Trucks.com, Joe Everhart, CEO of uh, JLRNA, uh, shared some of the changes that will differentiate the new Defender from the beloved original. Most of all, it has to be a vehicle that appeals as a daily driver to a more broad, uh, broader audience. There's that word again. As endearing as is simple, loud, leaky Defender is for many enthusiasts. It uh, does not make a best-selling daily driver for the masses. According to Eberhardt, the new Defender will retain some of the original appeal, but it's a vehicle that can be driven every day as long as you want as opposed to the old Defender. I don't know. I live with a Defender. I'm not sure I completely agree with that. I would drive one all day long. I have no problem with that. According to another spokesperson at JLRNA, the vast majority of people are living with this day to, this car day to day, so it needs to be refined and comfortable, but also live up to the Defender name. I've driven the early prototypes, and they are so refined. I think everyone will find something to enjoy. I think that's the thing to to point out there. He, this uh, Nathan Hoyt spokesperson, I think everyone will find something to enjoy. I think that's. I think you'll see that repeatedly. Uh, however, don't think the Defender is going completely soft. Just as much as the new vehicle's designed for day-to-day -day comfort, it's also designed to be capable. Approach and departure angles, durable components, and ground clearance are all considered of top importance. There will also be plenty of whiz-bang technology, likely at the minimum offering the off-road technology suite of the other Land Rover vehicles offer. However, that cannot stand alone. Per Pete Simkin, Land Rover Vehicles Program Director, capability is a combination of the basic physical things as well as having the right technologies. You need both geometry and the clever technology to support it. And according to Everhart, you want to be able to scale something safely. The new twist is you should be able to do that as comfortably and unassisted as possible. <laughs> I, 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 I know. I read, when I read that the first time, I saw the unassisted as possible, and I thought that was interesting, which basically means, you know, I think that means minimal technology. That's, that's how I took that. That's how I would hope that he means it. Well, I would hope, but I have a feeling he means there's so much technology that you don't have to do anything or think about anything. Yeah. Unassisted, meaning it just does it for you and you don't have to get out the recovery gear and the and the winches and the other stuff. It does make a lot of sense. I read it the same way. We'll find out. Hopefully uh, hopefully, I'm more right than you guys are. But, uh, yeah, I'm, I yeah, guess I was... Yeah, but how often does that happen? I don't know. Well, I'm trying to be positive, Harold. Trying to be positive on this. Why? Uh, because... It, it's, it's, you know, because why not? It's better to be positive. All right. As JLR faces various financial troubles from various worldwide factors, the success of the Defender is vital to the success of the company as a whole. Just as the Range Rover and Discovery have spawned a million uh, families of vehicles, a Defender family is possible, maybe even likely. Eberhardt said there is potential for other vehicles. We're launching the first one, and there might be others coming. Uh, there are already, uh, and that's the end of the quote, there are already short wheelbase two-door and long wheelbase uh, four-door test models in the wild and rumors of a pickup truck. 
Theoretically, if the Defender were perceived as too soft when it's on sale, a more rugged model could also become a new family member, though this may be a bit of a stretch. Shouldn't be a stretch. Yeah, um, I... Um, that should be a given with the Defender family, yeah. that they're going to make a, ru a rugged one. Yeah, absolutely. Or, and, or come out with a pickup now. I think that would be... G given that the uh, what Jeep has come out with that uh, Wrangler pickup, it almost right. makes and, sense. And the like Jeep guys are all over that. Yeah, yeah, they've been waiting for that for a long time, and you know, a pickup truck version would sell in the U.S. And we've just come out with uh, Ford just came out with the uh, the Ranger, the smaller pickup here in the U.S., an updated version of that. And I think that's selling well, if I'm not mistaken. So I think it would be a kind of a smart move to move on that. Uh, continuing, a Land Rover is also betting on the accessory market being big with a Defender. This was actually, I thought this part was good to hear. From rooftop tents to cargo carriers and tow packages, they will likely carry an extensive range of dealers, and the aftermarket uh, will almost certainly go gangbusters for the vehicle. The future may resemble the accessory boom that supported the D1 and the D2, the new Defender may also may not be as rugged as the old one, and enthusiasts should know that uh, enthusiasts should know that loud and clear by now. But the goal is that it will be a catalyst for new markets to tap their dominant sense of advent dormant sense of adventure, not dominant, but dormant sense of adventure. I guess they want to be dominant. It may not be able to conquer a 1980s Camel Trophy uh, route or drown itself in a river and keep going, but it's a still very capable vehicle with a Defender nameplate. Inspires New Land Rover fans to see new things and have new experiences. Is it should be wildly successful at its most vital task, inspiring the core Land Rover concept, the spirit of adventure. Uh, you know, the thing about it where he says it may not be able to drown itself, if it does not have a wading depth as least as deep as the Disco, they failed. I agree with you there. Agreed. They, they did great things with the wading depth on the Disco, so yep. they should be able to make it happen in the Defender. Right. So, I mean, they should at least be able to get that depth. And if they can't get that depth, they screwed up. But as a defender, it should be more. I'm pleased to hear that they're actually looking at putting all the uh, accessories and so on on the thing, opening it up, unlike the uh, LR4 and so on. One of the strengths of the vehicle has always been the ability to put a lot of different things on it. And that only helps sell. Right. Yep. I would agree. And I thought was reading that from Atlantic British putting that together with some other stuff we've learned, like we know that the uh, Rovers North folks have seen the new Defender, so I'm, I'm going to make the assumption that the Atlantic British folks have seen the new Defender, guessing they've been told or they have heard or they understand that accessories are going to be a big part of this and you because know, they, they probably want to keep that, keep that business, of course, and they've already seen what's coming. So I, that pulling those threads together, it seems like very likely then that there will be accessories and the ability for cargo carriers and rooftop tents and awnings and winches and things. It'll be interesting to see how much to that market the Land Rover goes after themselves with the dealer network versus allowing the aftermarket to chase that. I suspect they'll go after it heavily, Harold, to... Uh because they're having, that's part of the Accelerate, Harold. That's part of Accelerate. Uh, yeah, okay, all right. <laughs> I would hope so. Yes. You know, you can you can buy a fully built-out Jeep with third-party accessories off the dealer lot. You should be able to do the same with a Defender. And I'm sure the third-party market, the, the, you know, the Atlantic British's, Lucky 8's, the Rovers North, they're, they want to get into that business too. I'm sure it'll be something for everyone in different ways. I'll have a link to the fulltrucks.com article if you want to read that. You can check that out from the show notes. But then there was also, in uh, New Defender News, the 2020 Land Rover Defender test with six-cylinder petrol engine at the Nuremberg Ring. And it's about 30 seconds of it uh, driving around parts of the ring, so you can actually see it moving. It's still in its uh, uh, development camo. And you still can't see what it looks like, but you can see it moving. I, you know, and I, when I saw this, Harold, and I was thinking about it, I think I don't think there's a lot of cladding on that anymore. I think the or, or uh, I don't think anymore there's a lot of cladding on it. I thought there was in the beginning, but the more I see it, the more I tend to think they've just. I've, I've seen some other pictures of it close up or semi close up, and it looks like there is a lot of cladding. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. I I, I kind of got the impression. Yeah. I was starting to think that there wasn't. That it was going to look pretty much like a, what we see there. I think there's a lot of boards around the windows to change the shape of the glass. Okay. For instance, for instance. Right. Actually, speaking of Lucky Eight, they recently had some photos of it on on a pallet ready to go on on a ship at one of the ports 
I think it was New Jersey or something. And it's it's definitely got a lot of extra padding on it. Do you mean ar- around the windows? Because I'm thinking that the outline shape, maybe that's maybe I should be a little more clear. I think the the roof line, the the hood, uh, all seem to be pretty set. Or do you it guys seems think to have a line? lot on the around the windows, some areas around the bonnet and the front end, and actually some on the upper portions of the windows near the the roof it's unclear i I, these are all good questions i just i was looking at that video and i looked at some of those some of the pictures and kind of looking at them again here it's tough to tell but then again that's why they use that development camo to kind of throw you off development camo aside it looked really stable going around the ring it did it that's a good yeah it was it was actually i think i said to you said you over slack it moves it actually goes fast which means it's not a real land rover oh because it does go fast you'll notice in all the all the pictures of this, I don't know if you guys have noticed this. There is no Land Rover badging on it at all. Like they, they, especially in the front on the grill, there is the Land Rover oval is not stuck on there. It seems like they've removed that out of uh, off the these prototypes. I don't know if that's a thing. Or... Except uh, on Instagram recently, there were some photos of one of the prototypes in the Northeast somewhere, and it actually does have written on the front of it Land Rover prototype, though oh. no badging. Oh, well, where where'd you see that? It was on an Instagram feed. It was on the story section, so it disappeared. Didn't get a chance to make a copy of it, but uh, <laughs> one of the people on Instagram ran across the prototype in a parking lot at night under a car cover, so lifted it up and uh, got a couple pictures of it. Whoa. Oh, that, okay. And they, and they didn't have time to peel the camo and get a really good look? Uh, I made some comments about they could have at least gone and taken some photos underneath the vehicle and see what's there and such, but there you unfortunately go. not. There was another uh, prototype there with all the uh, funky uh, colorings and so on on it next to it that it wasn't a Land Rover. It's probably a Jaguar one. That could be. Do, do you know if they were coming in or leaving the country? Don't know offhand. I'll see if I I'll contact the guy and see if I can get the photos and send them to you. Oh, that'd be cool. And then there was another video of the prototype moving, except this time this was from Motor One, the number one dot com, and they actually have video of it. It looks like it's cold weather testing. I'm going to say Norway, could be Finland, I don't know, but it's definitely cold weather testing. And there's, I think they have a minute video uh, of it. Uh, no, two minutes and 27 seconds. Oh, yeah, I didn't scroll. I just looked at the video. I didn't scroll down to look at the uh, at the text. They actually have text. So this is. Uh, I'm scanning. Sorry, everybody. I didn't realize there were so many articles this month that I was trying to get through them all, and I just I watched the video and moved on. I didn't realize there were more text. This one is definitely cold weather testing. And does it say where? It does not. Did you look read this article, Morgan? This is the short wheelbase, too. This is the short wheelbase and some testing. No, uh, I think I missed this article. And it, This is the MotorOne.com article. I don't know if you saw that one. So this uh, confirmed much-awaited... U.S. return, short and long wheelbase, uh, full LED light front and rear denote next generation will keep up with the times, as well as short overhangs. Uh, we did not get to check out what's going on on the inside of these two prototypes. I wonder if this was in the, was this not in the U.S.? I haven't, unless it was up in Canada, because we haven't had enough snow this year in the U.S. that I know of, at least in our Oh, uh, in section. the Midwest, they got Midwest plenty. did? Okay. Well, this has uh, European plates on it, although, I mean, that doesn't mean that it what didn't come, it doesn't mean it wasn't in the U.S., though. Not sure. But there's more video to see if you want to see it underway. This does not say, this is from Motor One, they do not say where they caught these pictures. Some, some good close-ups if you want to check that out. And uh, moving on to, could the Jeep Wrangler steal the Land Rover Defender's Thunder? And this is from uh, Coventry Telegraph in the U.K., Really, the title mentions it all. That I'll read you a couple uh, hits here from the article. It's three years and counting since the last Defender rolled off the production line at Load Lane. January 2016 saw the Defender's retirement and was marked with you know the fanfare. However, could the Jeep be about to steal Land Rover's Thunder 71 years after it served as the inspiration? The Wrangler has been around in some form for another quite a while, and in truth never really been much of a match for the Defender, but could the tables be set to turn? Given people want, uh, who want a new Defender will have to wait uh, four years. Well, not four years from now, I don't think. It's probably just going to be a year, but they might get fed up and decide a Wrangler is an Xbox option. The new Wrangler had its UK launch this month, having gone on sale in the U.S. last year. 
The launch saw motoring journalists put it through its paces in Cumbria, where, among other driving tasks, it undertook plenty of rigorous off-road testing. Just, I guess, more of a conversation piece that there, there is competition out there for for the uh, for the Defender. An entry-level Jeep Wrangler Sahara two-door starts at 44,800 pounds, while a medium-spec Overland model starts at 46,800 pounds. Step up to a Rubicon model, 48,000 pounds, and add a few extras. So it won't be long before you hit the 50,000 pound mark. Like the Defender, the, Rain, uh, the Wrangler offers two styles, two-door, four-door, though they're not different uh, Defender-style wheelbases. The new Defender will continue to having a short wheelbase, long wheelbase versions. Engine-wise, the Wrangler has a choice of petrol or diesel engines, 2-liter, 2.2 diesel, and a plug-in hybrid set to join the fray at some point. Uh, if you're buying a Wrangler in its home market, you could opt for a gas-guzzling 3.6-liter petrol engine, but that won't be available in the UK. Well, I, I think, actually, the, the Jeep is going to hurt Land Rover. Well, at least, I, let me rephrase that. I think the Jeep could hurt the Defender worse in the UK market than it could here, just because there's a certain American mystique around it. For much the same reason we buy British stuff over here, mm. the Brits like to buy American stuff because it's cool, and I think that because it's cool and it's available, people may buy that Jeep over there instead of a Defender. Depending on what the new Defender actually looks like, the Jeep may be a more rugged option or it may look more like they you know they're they remember them and think they should be looking like the jeep still looks like a jeep the new defender may not look like a land rover worth noting here that last year more than two hundred forty thousand wranglers were sold in the u.s the 2019 range rover evoke review this is a four a five minute video so if you are in the market for a range rover evoke model you may want to check it out just as a Nice, I thought, review, even-handed. Generally liked things. It was a quiet vehicle, as long as you didn't rev it too much. I guess Land Rover has had some trouble dialing in on the nine-speed transmission. They've gotten better, but I guess not perfect. That still seems to be one of the negatives that the reviewers call out is the nine-speed transmission. It tends to have trouble, let's say, on the highway or going up hills, trying to figure out what gear to be in. But apparently around town, it doesn't do it. It is not a bad problem, so they... The reviewers recommend use the paddle shifters. I think that's a common problem with the transmissions that have a high number of gears, that they hunt a lot more on, on highway. <laughs> right. This past week, I was driving my Jetta, which is six-speed, came home, hopped in the uh, Defender, and was out on the road, and shifting through the gears, and I'm like, why is there no sixth? Why is there no sixth? At least you didn't call me up and complain that it won't go into sixth. Anymore. It won't go into sixth. Why? <laughs> Harold, where's sixth gear? Why can't I get into sixth gear? I won't pull back. Because sixth gear is in your other vehicle, John. Oh, oh, okay. Good deal. Good deal. Land Rover announces Range Rover Sport with 395 horsepower inline six for the U.S. So last month, Land Rover announced the special edition Range Rover Sport to its lineup called the HST. We mentioned it. Like the UK version, the Range Rover Sport HST pairs a 3-liter turbocharged inline 6 with a 48-volt mild hybrid system and an electric supercharger. That combination is good for 395 horsepower, 406 pound-foot of torque, significantly more than the 380 horsepower and 332 pound-feet of torque of the old supercharged V6. Land Rover estimates a 0-6 to six a uh, mile per hour time of 5.9 seconds, seconds, which, as we pointed out last month, is a uh, quite a bit quicker than 6.8 second time claim for the old V6 Sport. And this is a motor trend, by the way, saying these things. But while Land Rover called the HST a special edition in its UK release, it's a standalone trim level in the US. The same engine will also power the Range Rover Sport SE and HSE, but will all but will be detuned to make 355 horsepower, 365 pound feet of torque. That version will be badged as a P360. Well, the HST's more powerful configuration will be called the P400. Finally here, we won't have to wait for the new inline six to arrive either. Land Rover says it's already taking orders for all three trim levels. The SE starts at $69,795, including destination, while the more heavily optioned HST starts at $84,245. We now know why Jeff Aronson, friend of the show, was traveling to Europe because there uh, a flurry of articles came out about the 2020 Range Rover Evoque being tested in Greece. And we know Jeff was in Greece. So uh, this is not Jeff's articles, but others. This is Autoblog. 
Nearly a decade after the model made its debut, the 2020 Range Rover Evoque still looks audacious and sleek, especially in a compact SUV class where awkward styling and proportions are depressingly prevalent. I agree with their assessment. According to Land Rover Design Chief Jerry McGovern, haven't heard him in a long time, the Evoque mm. is the first Land Rover to sell primarily on its styling, so it's no surprising here that the model's redo, McGovern team's uh, McGovern's team waited to enhance rather than reinvent the look. However, they are not including the slow-selling two-door coupe or the convertible. All the body panels are new, yet the model is instantly familiar as an evoke. Uh, this despite the opportunity afforded by an all-new platform, JLR so-called premium transverse architecture, which was, that's the PTA, which was spurred by the need to accommodate electrified powertrains, including the eventual plug-in hybrid. Okay, so we got to go back and do some research, I guess, and figure out what's the difference between PTA and the MLA, because two articles here have contradicted themselves. And we well, one is transverse and the other is longitudinal. No, 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 no. I meant, but as far, but this one even, but this says that the PTA is supposed to accommodate electrified powertrains, and we thought that was the MLA, right. ca case for the MLA. Well, yeah, no, I thought that the electrification was going to stay on the transverse platforms. So maybe one of these articles is wrong. I guess uh, we have to, we'll eventually, we'll do some or, research eventually. Or off, off on its timing or something. Yeah. Moving on here in this article, Autoblog article, look closely and one sees the evolution in a slimmer head, head, head lamp and tail lamp unit and the flush amount of door handles barred from the Ovalar, the characteristic fast sloping roof line and rising belt line return, but the overall design further reduces unnecessary decorative elements to a bare minimum. The model has been a hit for Land Rover, selling uh, 100,000 units per year globally, in part because of its uh, urban-friendly size. While the wheelbase has been stretched by 0.8 inches, its overall footprint isn't. The additional space between the axles has produced a welcome increase in rear seat knee room, and redesigned mounts for the front seat allow for a bit more space for backseat passengers to wiggle their toes. But the Evoque remains less spacious than a BMW X1 or Volvo XC40. A redesigned rear suspension yields a bit more cargo space, now 21.5 cubic feet behind the rear seats and 50.5 with them folded, which puts the Evoque's cargo space on par with the, uh, X, the BMW X2. The new Evoque's interior is modern minimal and minimalist. The center touchscreen is similar to that in the Velar and affords dual functionality with a 60-40 split. Below is a high-gloss center stack. Features all touch, no, touch-sensitive. Features all touch-sensitive buttons, excepting a volume knob and two large dials that primarily control temperature and fan speed. There are no other physical buttons, knobs, or switches, all available. And available virtual instrument cluster offers an even more screen-based experience. JLR's two-liter turbocharged four-cylinder Ingenium gasoline engine returns in the same uh, two strengths. The P250 model makes 246 horsepower. 260 pound-feet of torque. The P300 makes 296 horsepower and 295 torque. And those, by the way, are the metric horsepower ratings, uh, the P numbers. The Evoque debuts Land Rover's first 48-volt mild hybrid system. It allows the engine to shut off when braking at speeds below 11 miles per hour, and it smooths engine restarts. The starter generator recovers energy under braking, which is stored in a 0.2-kilowatt uh, battery located under the floor. It supplements the powertrain under acceleration but does not increase total horsepower uh, or torque figures. U.S. Evokes will also get the hybrid system, will get the hybrid system only with the high horsepower P300 engine. Other markets will get it with the P250 engine. And the transmission is a new 9-speed automatic that replaces the previous 9-speed. The P250 feels adequately spry in around-the-town driving. It was only at highway speeds that we might wish for a greater muscle of the 300, P300. In all cases, the 2-liter engine is... Note is muted, and we found the Evoque to be a hushed freeway cruiser, even at 80 miles per hour or better. In city driving, the highway system effectively eliminated the annoying vibration from engine restarts. All-wheel drive is again standard, but is newly able to disconnect the rear wheels to increase efficiency. Isn't this go sport? have a front-wheel drive version only and didn't the old the old evokes had front-wheel drive only right anybody re recall that i don't remember yeah I, so no, I, I thought the evoke was always a four-wheel drive no drive. no there was huh. there was there were i think when they either first came out or for a period of time there are front-wheel drive versions only gotcha I, I thought of the evoke and of the disco sport maybe it was just the evoke though 
I, yeah, I don't think that's the case for the Disco Sport. Mm. Continuing on, despite this innovation, EPA numbers for both the 246 horsepower version and the hybridized 269 horsepower version are down compared to the outgoing car. 20 city, 27 highway. That's uh, losing one city and two highway. When estimates for the higher output engine are 21 and 26, that's down one and down three. We're told to blame the more responsive new transmission, and we wouldn't trade away the improvement in drivability. We do note, however, that the Evoke CPA numbers fall shy of most competitors, including those of its stablemate, the Jaguar E-Pace, which uses the same two engines, but without the hybrid assist system, and achieves 21 and 28. The Evoke's sloping roofline and high belt line uh, made for blinkered rear vision in the outgoing model, or as McGovern concedes, quote, that tiny window at the back that you can't bloody see out of, unquote. The new version gets around that situation by offering what Land Rover calls its clear sight rear view mirror, which can be switched from a standard inside mirror to an HD screen that displays the feed from a rear mounted camera. Actually, in that one video I saw the rear mounted camera is in the antenna fin that's in the back of the, it's up on top of the back of the vehicle. The camera offers a wider 50 degree field of view, but on our sunny day drive, we were bothered by reflections on the glass. Uh, additional cameras, one mounted in the grill and two in the side mirrors, comprise the available clear sight ground view system, which stitched together a view of what is immediately in front of the car as if the front sheet metal were see through. So I think this, that was the old uh, through the bonnet thing, right? The ground yeah, view. Yeah, exactly. The ground view feature might be most useful when for wheel placement in challenging off-road driving, but it will also has value in the urban jungle when nosing into parking spaces with high curbs. Additional camera angles can be summoned, include a top-down view alongside the car to avoid curbing the stylish uh, wheels, a forward view of cross traffic, wonder how they do that, and the standard so, backup so, camera. So that you can drive while watching the screen instead of looking out the front window? Yes, that's a, yes, exactly. Does that yeah. mean you can you can you can like Bluetooth it to your phone and then you can watch on your phone as you're driving? We're we're back to the James Bond driving the BMW through the car park. Don't forget autonomous driving. Yeah, yes, yeah, just that's that. Yeah, you won't, well then you won't even need the cameras then, Dixon, because you won't be driving. So continuing on, a newly enhanced gradient release control which I think is a, a new feature. When stopping on a steep ascent, this hill hold feature will keep the brakes engaged even after the pedal is released until the driver steps on the accelerator. Previously, the system could hold the car for three seconds. Now there is no time limit. It can also function as an auto hold system in stop and go traffic if the driver so chooses. So there is your 2000... 20, right? 2020 Land Rover, Range Rover, Evoque uh, 2, right? Should that be the Evoque 2? I mean, it should be, but it, it's not. It's just the Evoque. <laughs> yeah, I don't think Jerry likes uh, Series 2 on things, does he? Doesn't seem to. Well, I think we're all happy with calling things just what they are. Right. The electric. Jaguar I-Pace wins a car of the year in Europe. It edged out the Alpine 110 in a tiebreaker. So uh, this is the first time that Jaguar has won such an award. The four-wheel drive vehicle edged out the Alpine A110, which is not a mass production car, after they tied for top honors in the first round of voting by dozens of automotive journalists. The five finalists were the Citroen C5 Aircross, the Ford Focus, the Kia Seed, the Mercedes A-Class, and the Peugeot 508. Last year's winner was the Volvo XC40. How do you feel about that, Harold? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it's better than the alternatives. That's, it's, I guess true. It's better than being not considered and, and then you know losing. Uh, in some def what I consider to be Defender or at least Land Rover competition news, uh, Autoblog spent some time with the Bollinger folks, and they have a 4 minute, 18 second video on the Bollinger B1 SUV. This is the all electric Bollinger. Recommend you out and check it out. It's, it's actually pretty slick. They talk to the guys, they show it moving and the things they thought of and what they did. The doors can come off, and you know, they talk about the pass through so that you can uh, from one end of the vehicle to the other. Yeah, I mean, I gotta say, I'm more likely to buy one of those than I am the new Defender. Why is that? Agreed. Because it's just cooler. Okay. It's more it's more useful. It's more of the things that I would use a defender for. That you know, the new defender is not gonna have that pass through for the long lumber and, and uh it looks cool too. I like it. Even if the yeah, it's, what if the defender came out with a pickup version? Well, all right, maybe. But you know, the Bollinger handles a lot longer stuff than any pickup can. 
again, that pass through is a really cool feature. It reminds me of the old uh, Chevy Avalanche with the, the the drop down wall between the back seat and the right. pickup bed. Right. But yeah. you know, it's got it in the front bulkhead too, so you can send stuff all the way through. Yeah, and it's very much styled more like a classic Land Rover or Defender. It I mean, looks like even the down Defender to a metal should. Dash. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it looks like the Defender should. It really does. Basically, basically that's a video that you sh people really should go and take a look at because the, that is a fantastic vehicle when you see the, see the uh, pass-through on the video and everything else. It's, that's a it's very interesting. I'm waiting for the long wheelbase version. Of course, my questions are about recharging and how long it it has. Those those are kind of also important questions. Typical electric vehicle questions, mm -hmm. but exactly. I mean, if you're just going on the merits of the of the design of the vehicle, it's I think it's in many ways better than the Defender is going to be. Looking at Bollinger Herald, you can reserve yours now for zero dollars at BollingerMotors.com. Yeah, it's too bad zero dollars won't be the final price once it's available. <laughs> Uh, speaking of looking like a Defender or like the original, as we some say, what the Defender should look like, Project Grenadier. And this is from The Guardian. The UK's richest. And project with a K, folks. The UK's richest man, expat supporter, uh, Brexit supporter uh, Jim Radcliffe, has enlisted Germany's BMW to supply engines for the Land Rover Defender successor. Well, as he sees it anyways, uh, after handling the vehicle design contract to another German firm, Enos, the chemical company he founded in 1998, uh, he has uh, an estimated 21 billion pound fortune, said BMW has joined a partnership aiming to build an uncompromising new 4x4 vehicle. It called the tie-up with BMW a major step forward in its plans to build a vehicle market to consumers around the world. Enos announced a year ago that the Stuttgart-based engineering firm MB Tech would take the initial design concepts through to a fully engineered vehicle followed by prototypes that will be produced in, in 2018. I'm sure, I guess that was last year in Germany. Well, that was part of the evolution of the Land Rover, so you know, he's following tradition. That's, that's true. I guess there was that, yeah, another BMW connection. Kind of interesting how... Uh, He's u utilizing BMW's knowledge that BMW probably got from Land Rover <laughs> building the X5. <laughs> One way to get around licensed L uh, LR technology. Oh, I hadn't thought of that. That's a that's good thinking there, Harold. Just yeah. buy the stuff that BMW stole from Land Rover. Come on, they bought. They bought. Yeah, it's a, that was not a buy. That was a corporate raid. Speaking of raiding, thanks for that uh, transition, Harold. Sure, Tor anytime. Taurus yell as elephant raids and almost flips Land Rover. It there, there's really not a story here. It was just kind of fun to see an elephant going into the back of a looks to be a 109 trying to raid the raid the refrigerator and find some food. It doesn't it doesn't flip the Land Rover, but uh, there was a little bit of a concern there. Watch watch out for your uh, your food while you're near an elephant. Yeah, well, you know we have that problem here here with all the elephants we have in Latrobe, so. Well, actually, it, it is kind of applicable, Harold, because here we would have more concern with bears. Yeah, and yeah, it's they, a sim similar sort of problem, I guess. Minus the opposable trunks. Yeah. <laughs> opposable trunks? Elephant trunks? Yeah. Okay. All right. I, I think it's more a prehensile trunk than, a, than an opposable one. But. Yes. <laughs> Finally, in Land Rover news, Hot Wheels has a Series 3 pickup available it's a Land Rover Series 3 pickup, Hot Wheels, the the you know, the Matchbox, the little toy cars, and this one even comes with, has a winch on it, and it looks really cool. So that was actually Mike, who couldn't join us today, he sent that over. I, I pref still prefer it in a one-to-one -one scale, but okay. <laughs> of course. I would as well, and, and I, I have to say I'm a little preferential to the actual Matchbox brand as opposed to Hot Wheels. Uh, oh, is, they, oh uh, is there a difference? They were... Hmm. There is a difference. Well, yeah, uh, the Matchbox tends to be more like factory original ver versus the Hot Wheel, which is the aftermarket enhanced version. It's true. And Matchbox actually started out as a company called Lesney, mm -hmm. which yep. was started in Lesney, England. So, or uh, sorry, not strike that. <laughs> I don't remember where. I think the family name was Lesney. So they're have, so Lesney's have, a British uh, company? Yes. I, I grew up with lots of Lesney Matchbox cars. So yeah, it's uh, it's quite a memory thing for me too. Yeah. I still have one of the original Land Rover Series 2 
F109s. Yeah, I have uh, one of those expedition models that uh, came out a couple years ago. I have one of those. Actually, some coworkers got that for me when I was leaving a job. That was their little little, little going away gift. I went looking for this pickup. I couldn't find it. Where do you where do you normally? I went to Target. Is there a better place to to go check? I don't. I haven't look, had to look for Matchbox toys in forever. Oh, uh, probably Walmart. Go out and check your uh, your local stores for a if you uh, get your own Series Three pickup. Again, Going through I like... a bit of a hailstorm here south of uh, Syracuse, so I had it was on mute. <laughs> There's actually a Matchbox station wagon with the luggage on top that's been reissued that you can get for a buck at uh, Walmart. Oh, that's cool. Okay. So Walmart sounds like the place to go check out for Matchbox and Hot Wheels. All right. What's the What was the German company that made the bigger ones? I have, uh, in fact, I'm looking at it right now because I have one in, oh, Brudar. This one's yeah, Bruder, yeah, Bruder, Bruder. and and uh, then there's like the die the diecast companies like Maisto and some of those that, that make them too. But there you go. That could be a, maybe a whole another sub podcast, which I'm not going to ha- do. But that sounds like it could be another whole podcast on Land Rover diecast and models. Well, I suspect there are diecast collector podcasts or websites out there. I collect diecast cars too, but but not Land Rovers, because my my specialty in the die cast is things that I'm not likely to ever own in full scale. That's a good way to do it. Because if it's stuff I could have in full scale, or I already do have, what's the point of having the model? I'll just go outside and look at the real thing. Well, if you want to connect, collect the Brudar ones, check out eBay. They could go upwards of a 1000 bucks for some of those from the 60s and 70s now. Wow. They didn't make many of them. That's good. Good check out. Well, the one nice thing, Harold, though, is they tend to break less. You know, you don't have to put a lot of miles on on the diecast ones. Yeah, but they don't do as many important things. <laughs> and on that note, that's the news for March 2019. Commonwealth Classics is a direct importer of classic cars and trucks from Europe and South America. They're a registered Virginia dealership with a physical showroom just 45 minutes west of Washington, D.C., They specialize in importing and restoring different makes, models, and variants of vehicles not originally sold in the United States. Their vehicles are imported, titled, and available for you to test drive before you buy. For the Land Rover enthusiast looking for two-door Range Rover Classics, TDI-powered Discoveries, or beautifully restored Defenders, their showroom in Marshall, Virginia is a unique destination. Looking for something special? They can help source, restore, and import that special truck you've been looking for. Contact Commonwealth Classics for your next classic vehicle. Commonwealth Classics. Visit www.cwclassics.com. From the wilds of Alaska to the searing heat of the outback in Australia, what will you find in the back of a discerning overlanding vehicle? An LT Wright Knives Overland Machete, of course. These are handmade from 1075 high carbon steel and your choice of either black or natural Makarta. Need something that will stand out in the woods? Opt for the orange G10. It won't blend in with your surroundings wherever you wander. LT Wright Knives is a small company with a family feel. Located in Wintersville, Ohio, they have a passion for what they do. Anything from everyday carry to bushcrafting to the aforementioned Overland-specific piece. LTWK has you covered. Each knife is thoughtfully designed, built, and tested before it heads out the door. Although they look good enough for the display cabinet, these knives like to work. Put the knife through its paces and you know you're backed by a lifetime guarantee. So carve, slice, and chop to your heart's content, LTWK creates knives for bushcraft, EDC, hunting, cooking, and overlanding, so you have a lot of choices. Carry your preferred LT Wright knives, model with pride. You're helping to support an all-American company that will stand behind their product with a lifetime guarantee and the satisfaction of a job well done. These heirloom quality pieces will outlast your adventure, so plan well, drive safely, and carry an LTWK. Find out more online at ltwrightknives.com. And now on this Understeer podcast, calling us all the way from the great white north is Dixon Kenner of OVLR fame. OVLR is the Ottawa Valley Land Rovers. Welcome, Dixon, to the podcast. Good day. <laughs> well done, sir. Well done. Where, where are you calling from? Ottawa. Oh, capital nice. Of Canada. I have not yet been to Ottawa, and I've always wanted to go. I need to need to get up there. I've been to the birthday party a number of times, but I've I never made the detour to go off to, to Ottawa. Only about sixty miles east. Oh, really? Okay. Oh, well, 
I've been, you know, now that I'm talking to you, I've been thinking about going up to the birthday party this year. Maybe, uh, maybe a little detour and go over to uh, visit the Capitol. Dixon, you are a longtime Land Rover fanatic involved in the community for as long as I've been involved in the community and probably even longer before that. And we wanted to talk to you about two things mainly, which is OVLR and also the LRO list. So, so start off by telling us, so uh, what is OVLR? Where did it come from and how it started? So tell us about the beginnings of OVLR. Well, the beginnings of OVLR actually are earlier than the club. Back in 1974, a chap by the name of Harold Huggins moved from Yellowknife, Northwest Territories, down to Ottawa, and he brought his Land Rover with him. He was a judge or something. He thought the idea of having a club would be a great idea, and so started putting uh, business cards on people's windscreen screens as he found uh, Land Rovers and started up what was called the Association of Land Rover Owners of Canada, or ALROC. He got that going on a national basis, and after about 10 years, uh, they ran the transfer box, and so it was the magazine that came out out of Ottawa. Some of the people in various regions of Canada decided they thought it would be interesting to have uh, chapters. Roverlanders in BC is an example. OVLR was actually the first chapter that was formed in 1984. So you had the two organizations running uh, in parallel until ALROC finally fell apart, probably in the uh, early 1990s sometime. So LVLR has then continued on since 84 all the way till today. What about the other sub subclubs or chapters, I guess? Have they... Have they continued on? Uh, Roverlanders in BC is mm -hmm. quite strong and going. Most of the others have disappeared. Prairie Rovers is gone. There was an Alberta club that's been replaced a couple of times. I'm not sure what the status is out there. I think there's still one out there. There was relations with Tr TARC, which was the Toronto Area Rover Club, but it was always more aimed at cars. And the others, have they've just vanished. If you go on to the Land Rover FAQ, there's a section on clubs historically mm -hmm. in North America that uh, ben Smith and I have been able to put together of who's been where and roughly how long they were around, if they had a club newsletter and things like that. Where would folks find that? Oh, www.lrfaq.org. There, see, there it's we go. It's primarily a series-oriented uh, Land Rover uh, Frequently Asked Questions page that actually came out of the LRO list. We'll get to the LRO list. Uh, <laughs> OVLR stands for Ottawa Valley Land Rovers, and uh, that's been going on since, so it sounds to me like the early 80s or mid-80s. 1984 was the yeah. first year. It was Operation Frank for about a year before that, put out a bunch of newsletters and so on, and then they formed themselves into a chapter under LROC and then continued on with a monthly newsletter and a variety of events. Um, the birthday party, which started in 84, it's... I think the longest running continuous Land Rover event in North America, it runs the uh, maple syrup rally in the spring at irregular dates, depending on what Mother Nature says. And that, I think, is going to be possibly the second uh, oldest Land Rover event on the continent that's been running since, I think, 86 or somewhere around there. So it's got a couple of very long, long term events, and then it does does small things and tends to show people tend to show up in uh at other events all over the place the birthday party takes place what about 60 miles uh, west of uh, ottawa and north of toronto if i'm not mistaken is it still in that uh, oh, way location? way way east of toronto way east north, of toronto okay north by in terms of latitude but it's way east of uh, toronto okay. It's, okay it's parallel in latitude to ottawa and oh. it's near Silver Lake. That's it, Silver Lake. Uh, town That's of, to think town of yeah. Maberly is, or the village of Maberly is the closest place. It's been there probably since the late 1990s in that area. Oh, okay. Okay. Before that, it was near Almont on the land that used to be, or was the original site for the uh, Ethan Bunker, which oh. was a nuclear war type bunker the gov federal government was going to build, but it was too too wet there. So they built it. Closer to Ottawa. Ah, fair enough. Okay, okay. And uh, so, is there still that restaurant uh, that's out in front of the? There's like a, a federal no, provincial the, park there. The restaurant's gone. Uh, oh. the hotel is gone. Unfortunately, <laughs> couldn't the uh, the event couldn't sustain the uh, that restaurant, huh? Oh, that'd be a whole long tangential conversation about how travel and so on is changing from the '60s. 
Yeah, that's people true. People just don't stop as much as they used to. No, they don't. Well, they don't need to, right? I mean, they, they that's used, true. I mean, that's the same thing happened here in the PA Turnpike. They used to have uh, service centers about every hour or so, every sixty miles or so, and well, now that's there's what like you get three. for buying vehicles that don't break, <laughs> that that don't have to <laughs> uh, crest the uh, crest the mountain and wait to cool down before they go back down and the, the, do the mm-hmm. next hill. Yeah. For instance, yes. <laughs> or are even comfortable to ride in for very long periods of time. Or hold a conversation or, yeah. <laughs> I mean, geez, where's your sense of adventure, people? I know, I know. Terrible. Uh, it is, it is. So it still takes place at Silver Lake. How many, there's a, a system of trails. Do you guys maintain that? Uh, some of them are maintained. Some of There's a lot of crown land up in the area where the, the provincial government, the crown owns all the land. And so there's access trails and so on there. And there's other four by four clubs and so on that also are creating and maintaining the trails. So oh, it's good. not that difficult to actually keep a lot of it going. Right. Well, that's good. So there are other uses then oh, yes. by the clubs. That's good. You do any maintenance of the trails or is it just show up and off you go? Uh, I haven't really in a yeah. very long time, but other people in the club are certainly very involved in building right. some rebuilding bridges and, and keeping the trails and so on going with uh, some of the other clubs. I, I always remember hearing stories about it from Bill Fischel, and then when I actually went up there, it was always uh, interesting. My my uh, my one memory, and this has uh, I have several memories, but the one that always comes to mind since I think of the birthday party is all of the mosquitoes. There are a few up there. <laughs> 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 this, this birthday party takes place in June, usually what the second Saturday, I think, of June, and uh, uh, the, the weekend closest to the solstice. Solstice, and the and the the bugs are quite. I, I happy. would think that would be early in the mosquito season. Really, it is. It, it all depends on the snow and the and the winter and right. what's Cause going I, on. Because there have been some some events where you're just carried away by them, and others where it's they're actually fairly benign. Yeah, I remember growing up in Minnesota, the, the mosquitoes didn't get really bad till end of July, or early August, and then they were, yeah, they were bad by then. Yeah, this it all had... depends when the ice gets off the uh, lakes and so on. Well, that's that's part of it, yeah. Yeah, I think this had to be like 2004, maybe. That sounds, sounds familiar. We drove up and we set up camp and the pot. We were sitting there having having a beer, just waiting, and all of a sudden, <laughs> mosquitoes found us. Yeah, in, well, in Minnesota, we called them the state bird. Those are black flies up here. Yeah, the black Ooh, flies, too. too. Yes, that's right. There were a lot of black flies, yeah. That is why, to this day, I still carry bug spray in my vehicles because of that that from the birthday party event, because there were just so many of them. Well, the alternative is, is if you want to camp for free, you go to the main site. And if you want to pay a few bucks, you go to the Provincial Park, which actually has very few mosquitoes there. Oh, this was the Provincial Park. It was right next to the lake. (laughs) It was bad. (laughs) How does the event take place for those who haven't been? Is it fairly informal? Are there formal trail rides? There's a mixture. It's it's fairly informal. There are uh, organized trail rides and so on for the people that really don't know the trails or, or what's out there. But a lot of people will go and just get behind people that are have been there several times before right. and just follow along, whether it's the uh, original Light Off Road Trail, the, the Bolton Creek Trail. There's a number of them uh, around there. And there are maps that are given to people and such. GPS and mapping and so on is just night and day compared to what it used to be. It's rather hard to get lost. The, the site is, do you guys still have put up a tent and have some uh, oh, food vendors and the, things? The Albatross, the Club Expedition Trailer, is there with a <laughs> couple of large tents nearby to, to cover everyone in case of rain and to eat underneath. The usual porta potties and, and such like that. The uh, meals for the last probably decade and a half have been uh, catered in rather than uh, going and using the club trailer to try and cook for all these hordes of people. In that sense, it's, uh, it's very well organized and such. It is. Um, there's information about it on the uh, OVLR org website appears in the newsletter the facebook page will have a lot of information about it also is there a fee or is there, do you guys charge uh yeah there is a fee for it i'm not sure what it is going to be uh this year offhand i haven't seen all the propaganda yet <laughs> sure uh but it's we're talking like a hundred dollars fifty dollars oh, generally probably about fifty sixty dollars it's that's certainly good. a lot cheaper than the more a lot of the american events yeah. and then the canadian dollar is more of a northern peso at this point in time <laughs> about 70 something cents each i was gonna ask whose dollar we were talking about here so 
Oh, Kanakistan. Oh, what about fuel? Because you know, I assume uh, since uh, people are since their you know, travel, as we talked earlier, has changed a bit. Uh, what's availability of diesel and gasoline? Lots of availability of both. Currently, the uh, they have to do all the conversions, but it's about a dollar fifteen uh, a liter Canadian. So that comes down into the low eighty cents per liter, then multiply by three point eight four or something like that, yeah. three point seven two uh, liters per U.S. gallon. So about three, three, three and a quarter a gallon, maybe uh, yeah. for in in American dollars. It's like being in uh, Pennsylvania compared to uh, New York State or New Jersey. Already, already pay those prices. See? Yeah, we actually <laughs> pay more than that here because our taxes have gone up on fuel. Paid uh, three forty five for a gallon of diesel this past week. Right. So there's places to stay, whether it's a provincial park or whether it's on the what's the main site called? I guess just is there a field there or? <laughs> It's just a field uh, a little bit north of uh, Maberly. used to be just uh, south of Silver Lake, but it's moved over to another site now. Oh, okay. Again, I would uh, say that the website or Facebook for the maps and, and directions to actually get there. Right, exactly. And so there's fuel and, then the, and food. Is that similar food's to... Ca- food's catered in for mm-hmm. a couple of the meals and the rest of it, well, you're on your own or you can go into Perth or... Uh, the re- there's a restaurant in Maberly. There's you can go in Perth, which is a small town, probably about 15 minutes to the east. That has all sorts of pubs and everything else there. Okay. There's there's a fair number of opportunities around. Yeah, sounds all like uh like Mar really, in the in the way things are are done. Very similar, but smaller. The Mar is tends to be huge. Right. Yeah. So what are the what are the number of trucks typically you get or people you get to the event on average? Probably about uh. 40 trucks or so yeah, currently. Right. It's been higher than that. It's been lower than that. It all depends on year. You know, the key things that causes issues with people is uh, basically the end of the school year, how close you are to uh, Canada Day and which weekend it falls on. Because we have the uh, 1st of uh, July is a holiday. If the birthday party falls closer to Canada Day, people tend to what not want to do a double header or travel or things like that. So a lot of it's timing. So it goes up and down, but it's there's always a good turnout there. I, I encourage people to go. It's a fun event. Haven't been for a long time. But it was fun. We when we would go up uh, our club, we'd get to we'd get together, and meet up, and then we of course you have to go around Lake Erie and crossing over into Canada. We'd take a ferry from uh, from the American side to uh, uh, is it what, what's there's like an oh to what's, Wolf Island to ferry. Wolf Island yeah take the and and then you would make the border crossing this small ferry which held like two vehicles took you to Wolf Island and then there's the, the that's the border crossing I'm sure it's different now since uh, 9/11 but um, and then Wolf Island you drive across Wolf Island to the proper sized very large fitting what about uh, five cars abreast on the on the Wolf Island ferry. That's a nice ferry. You'll find that the customs coming into Canada is really hasn't changed from before. Oh, okay. It's uh it's fairly uh fairly reasonable. It's yeah, it's, it's the getting takes things a little more seriously. Yeah, yeah it's do. the getting home again that's the hard part. Uh can uh, the getting into Canada recently, no, I'd say in the last 5 years they've upped their less friendly game. They're they're a little more uh less less friendly. How about that? It depends. There's a lot of uh cross-border information being shared now. They know when right. you leave the United States and come into Canada and they know when you're coming back into the States. Oh yeah. You It'd be an entirely different conversation if you want to talk about what they know and what they don't know. <laughs> a lot more than you think. I am not. So, no, I, I think we do know, actually. And yeah, there's a reason there's not a wall there because there's other information exchanged. So you don't have to worry about that. The secret for dealing with border officials is answer their questions exactly what they're asking for in the fewest words possible. That's, yes, and yeah, don't yep. don't don't add anything, don't subtract anything. Just answer the question. Yeah, I, I, actually, don't. it was coming back from I think the birthday party one time. I was coming coming back, and the, and the American side, he asked me how much money do you uh, do you have on you, American? And I said uh, I don't know, twenty bucks. He goes, how much money do you have on you, American? I'm like I think it's twenty. He goes, how much money? I'm like went in my pocket, looked. Oh, I had twenty dollars and twenty five cents. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, exactly. Since you ask in the uh, ask the question the exact right way, the last time I actually came back across the border was coming in from Quebec and into the American side, and I was in the Defender. And the g- <laughs> can I get out of the truck? No. Okay. Wind the window down, and uh, he he, and then he asked me, uh, you know, took the passport, and then he asked me, where'd you get that? And I said, the UK imported. And he goes, 
do you have the title or the excuse me the registration do you have the registration yes can i see the registration sure <laughs> You know, like, yes, answer the question as he asked. He didn't ask to see the registration. He just wanted to know if I had it. Fun times. Yeah, so border crossings are always fun. Yeah, they are. Yes. You need to yeah, take them seriously. And, and as you said, just ask, ask the question uh, as, and an, answer the question that's asked. Nothing else. Nothing more. So the birthday party takes place, as we said, in June, close to the solstice. How did that happen? Well, the club's birthday is the solstice. Okay, and hence the name birthday party. That's where it got its name from. And this year, it's, I believe, the 22nd and 23rd of June. It actually starts on the 21st, which is the solstice. Yes, looking at the calendar, yes, June 21, 22. So there you go. And uh, so that's the... OVLR birthday party and always taking place close to the solstice and it's a fun time. It's a, it, it seems kind of a very laid back and chill event, not too stressful, but you know, make it up there and it's a, it's a good time. Good trails. How would you rate the trails uh, as far as you know difficulty types and and uh, you know damage level? That's a that's a difficult question. The light off road, for example, there there's water that will be crossing your floors of your vehicle. A lot of it comes down to the individual and how prepared they are. I've seen people go in with street tires on a Range Rover and have a horrible time. I go through there in my 80 inch and have no problems whatsoever. A lot of it all comes down to the, the driver, how they handle it. There's really nothing that difficult. There is the heavy off road if you want to go in, into a, an all day long mud bogging section or session. And I think. In only one year has vehicles actually gotten through that trail and not had to turn back. <laughs> there you go. There are some that feel they're not having fun till they've broken something. Oh, yes. So this would offer them something to do. Oh, very much so. That's always an entertaining one. Uh, what's the name of that, oh, right. that part of that trail name called? Does it have a name? It's just the heavy off-road. It's along the uh, follows the power line between the rail line and uh, the Highway 7. It has no name that I know of. So for the last couple of years, to go from the rail line to the heavy off-road trail, the ditch has been filled with a bit of water from some beavers. So your firewall is going to go underwater as you come down and up out of the thing. So it will thoroughly clean your vehicle. <laughs> so a snorkel would be a good idea. Uh, or go fast and don't get stuck. I, I think I like the beaver aspect of it. That, that could be a name for it. Uh, there's been some beaver dams on yeah. the light off road where you, when you drive down some of these submerged causeways, uh, you dip and you go right under in the front of the vehicle and then immediately come up again. It's uh, quite spectacular <laughs> and interesting. Your biggest challenge is, uh, is the duckweed that gets stuck in the radiator that you have to watch for. What is duckweed? Oh, it's just a fine uh, weed that grows in the water and okay. will clog up the radiator ah, on okay. some vehicles. So is it generally flat ground? Uh, is there, is there rocky sections? There's, it's, it's Canadian shield, uh, undulating uh, land and so on. It goes up and down. It's not that flat, but uh, again, no real rock sections. There is a rock garden to go and play in on one, one set of trails uh, with some hill climbs that most vehicles don't generally make up. Basically, there's everything on offer there, depending on what you're going to look for. Yeah. So what do you drive, and how did you get into uh, to the, to the, the, uh, the green oval? Well, the current daily driver is a 1951 80-inch that I picked up in 1998 for 450 bucks, and then spent, hmm. ooh, probably yeah, about 16 years. You won't get years. any part of it for 450 bucks anymore. <laughs> probably not, but uh, I was originally into Austin Minis and such and right on back before the internet you know always was interested in land rovers from you know wild kingdom and doctari and all those type of things but try and find one if they appeared in the classified pages if you happen to actually see it by the time you got around to phoning it was usually gone i got what i called the the bgb or big green beastie back in the very late 80s when i was over at a friend's place uh at another friend and we were discussing Land Rovers, and he asked us to describe what one looked like. We described it. And he said, I think there's one across the street in the garage, but it hasn't moved in 20 years. So we put down our beers, walked across the road, and there it was. So I knocked on the door and asked the guy what's, what he was doing with it, because uh, 
it had moved. He said, you want to buy it? <laughs> sure. <laughs> so I got my friends, well, I think it was a Bronco or something, and we towed the thing home and then went to slowly over about a year and a half and so on, uh, rebuilt it. In that time period, I discovered OVLR as a club. A bunch of them came over and helped me rebuild the vehicle. It was it was, it was very different from minis, that's for sure. And yeah, Mini's one of the few vehicles that can make an 80-inch Land Rover seem big. Uh, yes. Still have one in the backyard. It's another project. Well, do you All still right. do you still have that one that you found? The BGB? Yeah. No, I sold it, sold it to a, a friend a couple of years ago who is taking the whole thing apart and rebuilding it. It's going to be magnificent. Complete restoration? Complete restoration right down to every last nut and bolt. Wonderful. Okay, there sounds like another guest for the show. So that was a 51 Series 1, 80, 80 inch? The the 51 is the current one. That's it was a, a 64 109 station wagon was the first one I had. Ah, okay. And then they started, once I was in the club and the internet started, well, the internet really didn't get going to about 98. But once I was in the club, I started finding more of them. I think I was up to 12 at one point before I realized I should have. That's a good number. Yeah, that's calm a healthy myself. number. So Ooh. dropped it dropped it down, but I'm back up to, I think, five right now. Now, were all 12 functional and drivable? Of course uh, not. No, they weren't. Of course not. Yes, I knew that, but I just had to ask. That's yeah. The... No, the most I had running at any uh, one time was, was been two. The Little Earth Pig was a Series 288. It and the BGB coexisted for a while, and I sold that. Uh, rebuilt a 69 Dormobile, and then that sold into down to the United States. Oh, nice. Uh, Very nice. But I've got... Who has a Dormobile, do you know? <sighs> or is it still... You had to ask me that question. If I had gone and continued to talk, I would have gone and named, named him Sean something. Okay, that's lives fine. In, uh, lives in Roslyn on Long Island. Okay. All right, now I've got a 50, 51, 52, um, 80 inches. Uh, all the parts to build a, another early 2A wagon and a 76 uh, forward control 101. Whoa. Right on. And do I gather that you uh, frequently have what are dubbed 80 inch weekends? Uh, yes. If you're on Instagram and you type in pound 80 inch weekend, all is one word, you'll see that there's been quite a few of them that <laughs> go on down in New Jersey, along with the other hashtag of pound rover night, which is an almost weekly affair here in Ottawa where people gather to work on someone's Land Rover and try and resurrect it. Very nice. And I believe the 80-inch weekend is where you, you drive to New York, I think, every, what, for a weekend? I okay. uh, just drive down to central uh, New Jersey. Central Jersey. 666 kilometers. <laughs> <laughs> a very convenient number. That is <laughs> memorable. Which is, ironically, the distances between myself, Ben Smith in New Jersey, and Bruce Fowler in Maine averages out to about 666 kilometers. So it's the triangle of evil. <laughs> nice. Uh, that might be a show title, Triangle of Evil. At least it's not the kind where, like, no rover can ever leave that triangle or anything. <laughs> Has well, they all have to be running. One end of the triangle, you've got the winter romp. You've got blacker than night in New Jersey at the southern end. And you've got the birthday party and other antics up with OVLR at the top or on the western end. It's a pretty good trifecta. Mm -hmm. So what is Blacker Blacker than Night? That's not an event I've heard of. It's a small event in central New Jersey that Ben Smith runs. It's more of an invitational along the lines of uh, Guy Fox or okay. some of the, the other small events. Series oriented. You're not cool enough to know about that, John. I, I, I just found that out. You're, you're absolutely correct. Well, I do have a Series 3. Does that, would, that might get me in the club? It might start to. Ben does have a Series 3, though to me they're the beginning of the evil influences of British Leyland. They do have plastic dashes and things yeah, like that. they do. They they're, do. They're, they're more comfortable, I understand. Yeah. Negative I, Earth, yeah. There's, yeah. there's a sign of the devil. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds to me like almost 20 different rovers over the 30 or 40 years now. Which ones stand out to you? Any highlights? And sounds like nothing older than 76 then, touching on your Leyland influence. That would be the newest one, from 50 to 76, I guess. I, I much prefer the Positive Earth ones for the simplicity of them. 
The 80 inch is a delightful, small, nimble vehicle. One could, I could go on for a while about how it's not a very well designed vehicle, especially compared to an 86 inch. But please, please do. We, the, that's why we're here. Please do. I, I, that's not something we normally get to hear about. Well, the the 80 inch was a, as they say, was a stopgap. The bulkhead is pressed. It's not very strong. When you look, compare an 80 inch bulkhead with a an 86 all the way to basically series three bulkhead or into the defender it's much more angular it's got the the center uprights and so on so it's a much stiffer much better built thing having the brake pedals and so on going through the floor uh where they're going to catch all the mud salt and everything else compared to the pendulum style that they went to was uh you know makes it actually that's a more of a two a series two thing right right yeah that's a series two thing the pendulum pedals you know the 86 it's, it's got a, a larger load bed in the back so it's more useful and so on. A lot of small things. It's uh, just it's tough to package the drivetrain into the 80-inch wheelbase without having ridiculously short drive shafts and, and bad angles to the U-joints. All of them from 80-inch uh, through to early 2A are very simple vehicles, very easy to maintain. Oh, yeah. Is any of those your daily driver, or do you drive something more modern? In the summer, I'll use the 80-inch. In the winter, I've got a, a, a diesel Audi, which... Average is about 42 miles to the gallon when I'm not towing something and 29, 30 miles to the gallon when I'm flat towing the 80-inch behind it. One has to be fuel efficient occasionally. Occasionally, occasionally, yes. To, to, to fuel efficient to have fun. Well, the, the Land Rovers, the 80-inch through the t early 2As, they can you know, get 20, 21 miles to the gallon out yeah. of them if they're tuned properly. I guess you have a mixture of diesel and gasoline in your fleet then? Oh, no. The Audi's, uh, the Audi's uh, diesel, The all the Land Rovers are, uh, are petrol. Hmm. So what's the status of the 101? The 101 has been now moved into the barn, and it will be a, a future project. It's the next project in the queue. Right now I'm uh, doing a bunch of work on a 57 for a chap in Connecticut. And when that's done, do a bit more work on the... Uh, the 51 and the project after that is we have the another 80 inch frame sitting in the barn which were that was badly salted and rusted we're reinforcing and rebuilding that enough to go and put a drivetrain into it so we can then go and run a rear pto conig onto the front of uh, ben and my 80 inches wow cool and do it the uh, the way that PTO is supposed to run up underneath the uh, driver's floor, which we didn't think was possible until I saw an uh, advertisement for Ramsey uh, rear PTO winch, which the Conig is essentially a copy of, installed in a Jeep, uh, Willie's uh, Jeep from the Second World War, which, as we know, the 80-inch was designed around. And here right. was a solution for how to go and run a three-part drive shaft from the back of the gearbox all the way forward to the uh, the winch. Both be able to have uh, mechanical winches on the front of the vehicles to use. Very nice. And and the 101 is going to be uh, kind of an off-road vehicle, or are you going to turn it into like a camper or anything like that? It came with a, a homemade camper body. Uh, if someone wants it, they can have it. It'll it'll uh, it's an ex Luxembourg. It'll go get restored back into being a a, a GS General Service uh, 101, and we'll see where we go from there. So it's Luxembourg. It's left hand drive then. It is, yes. Cool. Is this something you tend to keep then, or do you? It sounds like you like to fix things up and and then find a new home for them. Uh, it depends. Fixed up the uh, the series two and the uh, and the dormobile, but. The 101 has been something I've been looking for for a long time. We'll see how it works out. The biggest issue with the uh, the 101 is how well can I actually drive the thing because it isn't the most comfortable. You know, I have some knee problems, and that finished me on 88s. Mm. There's a few inch difference between the, the size of a 109 versus 88 in terms of where the rear bulkhead is and how the seats go, and that makes a huge difference on where your knee is when you're trying to go and hold an accelerator pedal down over long periods of miles, it got to the point where I just couldn't drive it in 88. So I have no problems with 109s. Well, if the problem is the accelerator, a brick will take care of that problem. That's true. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> on, a, on, a, on a rope so that you can pull up, pull up on it when you need to ah. slow down. That's what the kill switch is for. <laughs> That's also what the hand throttle is for in the center of the dash. That's you true. That That's too. true. Yeah, you can use that. Yeah. That's, and throttle, brick, they pretty much do the same thing. I like, that is true. I like to point that out to my 109 and tell people it's cruise control. What? 
I'm like, oh yeah, that's, that has all of our conveniences: cruise control, climate control, speed referenced automatic climate control. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it yeah, also has speed the optional bug screens, and it, uh, yes, and has speed compensated noise. The faster that's you true. go, the noisier it is. Yeah. How many of the five are functioning? Then it sounds like the 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 one hundred one needs Just, needs work. The one hundred one uh, needs to be the engine needs to be put back together again. When I bought it, uh, the engine was apart. It came with a lot of boxes of parts and so on. So that'll go back together again and redo the hydraulic system and it should go. The 50 needs a lot of parts that actually are dated. It was a complete running vehicle. Oh, probably about 20 years ago it was bought by a chap or actually by three people who brought it down to little more than a, a rolling chassis for the bulkheads there, the rear box and, and a lot of it's there, but the engine drivetrain is Engine gearbox and so on is gone. The front wings are gone. Breakfast and such are all gone. To go and rebuild it as a 50, because it's one of the very early ones that came into North America, need to go and get the parts that actually came go on it for that year. I've got parts for 51, 52, 53 and such, but they're not the correct ones. So it's to find the right parts, rebuild that one. And just for Harold's reference, that, that particular Land Rover was $90. Wow. <laughs> At ninety Canadian. Yeah, there's actually a bit of an amusing anecdote with so it. So fifty I got bucks it, then. When yeah. I got it, I was curious to know when it was built. So I wrote Land Rover uh, a letter saying, "Here's the serial number and so on." And oh, by the way, the the numbers on the axles don't match and so on. I thought they did. Could you explain this to me? I got a very nice letter back from Mr. Pagan at Land Rover Traceability that said that. Well, obviously, the front axle went to Tagadikia. The rear axle went to, I think it was Uganda. The <laughs> chassis went to Canada. And somewhere along the line, well, you, the vehicle obviously had to have the axles replaced. So they were shipped from Africa to Canada. And it was all <laughs> put together. And this is why your vehicle has things that don't match. And, well, I did get the uh, the build dates and so on for the African vehicles, which actually went into the uh, Land Rover FAQ on the pages where we have all huge thousands of serial numbers of vehicles and the build dates and their original colors and where they were supposed to have been shipped to. So that was interesting. Oh, and the 52 Herald, it was free. It was given to me. I'm <laughs> <laughs> right. not exactly sure why I'm, I'm the recipient of the pricing of all this stuff, but okay. You were so, convenient. You all right. <laughs> so, so Dixon, sounds like you're a series I'm guy. I'm an easy target. Sounds like you're a series guy through and through. Any interest in any of the slightly more modern? I, I, I won't even ask you about the current state car. Have you thought about a, you know, like a Disco 1? Uh, driven 1, thought about it. At one point, nearly got a, a Disco 1, but in the end went with a, a different vehicle as a, as a daily driver. Uh, I find the, the modern stuff, the reliability just really isn't there. And, well, they actually all look kind of bland now. I'm not sure I would touch one of the modern ones. Well, you, you wouldn't be able to work on it, and that kind of is a big, big detractor. No, and when you've got a company that's reveled in the uh, the bottom of the JD Powers uh, reliability <laughs> stats, and then you've got the Freelander, which I would argue there are more 80-inch Land Rovers on the road in North America today than there are Freelanders on the road in North America today. As that's it should be. Statistic. As no. it should be. I think you are correct on that. I don't. I don't think there's any debate on that one, Dixon. <laughs> Having brought my my Freelander to the birthday party, I was one of the few. I I, that I think that actually showed up ever in a Freelander at the birthday party. Freelanders are good for catching falling chimneys, and they're hardly fit for that. Yeah, that's yeah. Yeah, I know. Thanks for bringing me down, Harold. Thanks. Uh huh. Sure. Anytime. I know. I know. Well, if you've still got it, you can give uh, Roy Caldwell out in Helena, Montana, a ring. He's Got the Western Hemisphere Area Freelander Enthusiasts Group. Oh. Because <laughs> he's trying to rebuild or make a Freelander alive again, which is proving to be an interesting adventure because every possible dealership that anyone has contacted, we've contacted them here in the East to try and find any of the special tools, all tossed out a long time ago with gusto. We might have a, we might have a truck for him, Harold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm selling parts, that's for sure. Yeah, that sounds like a opportunity for that. Yeah, and actually do something with it. I bet him through the LRO list, which is a, a very interesting community. It's uh, much diminished, but it was uh, well, an yeah. offshoot of the Brit British cars mailing list back in the late 80s. 
So yes, give uh, us the background so the of what the RL and for our listeners, the RL list is the Land Rover owners list. It's a text, it's an email only kind of text situation. Where where to come well, from? And it it dates back to dial at BBSs, doesn't it? I'm not the LRO list itself, and there's actually a bunch of child LRO lists for different regions. There's an Australian one, a South African one, a, a UK one, and then the main LRO list, which is more North America oriented. It was uh, formed as a split off of the British Cars mailing list, which was uh, an early internet mailing list running through use of well, Unix to Unix copy program, it, telephones and things like that. The bullet it was on some bulletin boards, but it was mostly between uh, academic and uh, government people, because that's all the internet was at the time. There was a number of people on it in the late 80s, early 90s. Many of the names you'd be familiar with, uh, Ben Smith, Russell Dushin, Terry Ann Wakeman, Bill Colosia. It just goes on and on with the various people. And Bill Colosia created the LRO list as a tangent for people just wanting to talk about Land Rovers, because the British Cars list had different groups of people that were either discussing Triumphs or MGBs or Morgans or Land Rovers and just to sort out the volume of mail at the time because that really was the only uh, way to communicate with people at the time over a distance besides the post office or the telephone. There was quite a bit of volume there. And so the LRO list was born, expanded to oh, a thousand people on it or more at one point in time and just spanned the globe. And it was fantastic for you know, getting people together to go to events and getting the clubs, especially North America, together. You know, if the LRO list had not existed, we would have never had the uh, Anarch event at Greek Peak, for example, in 98, where you got uh, Bay State Club uh, with Jim Pappas got together with the, with Rove under Sandy Grice, together with uh, OVLR with uh, Christine Rose and so on, and ran a, that, that huge event that occurred down in... Uh, central uh, upstate New York. And the list, is, it's still still running after uh, Bill Colosia, unfortunately, sadly passed away. It was run out of my dining room for a while and now is uh, in the cloud. Oh, is, oh, so it has finally moved to the cloud, huh? It is in the cloud right now, yes. You guys were nice enough to host Fort Pitland Rover Group for a website for a good while. Appreciate that. Yep. The, I, when I moved into this house in 98, as a temporary measure, a computer was set up in the corner of the dining room, and it's still there. And <laughs> still it's running? Hosted. Yep. Well, not the same computer, no. Okay. All right. We've gone to Unix and so on. It was originally a PC, and, well, version of PC, uh, running Unix. And uh, one of the Arizona clubs was hosted there originally. The Rover Web was on it. The LRFAQ was on it. OVLR site was on it. But for speed and efficiency, we've uh, put portions into different cloud instances, as well as uh, using the, uh, the server here. So when you go onto the sites, you could be in any one of three locations. It's all done transparently. So yeah. if one wanted to join the LRO list, and maybe you might uh, you know, get some additional folks doing that, what's the, what's the focus? What do people talk about? And I mean, I, I'm on there and I'm a member, but curious what... Uh, yeah, I am too, but I, I, I don't really talk that much, but I, I enjoy reading some of this stuff. But man, can that list to diverge into an argument about oils and <laughs> grease versus oil and the swivel housing and... Now, let's not bring up grease versus oil. Come on. <laughs> Put it's both not, in. We don't have all freaking <laughs> nights. So. Topics are just all over the place. But it, it seems like it's mainly more of a series-focused list. It's, it's a series-focused list uh, now. Yeah. Uh, LRO-UK is is the, the Brits, though there's a lot of Americans on that one. The South African one is, is, Afri is, uh, is active for the people down in South Africa. And so is the uh, Australian one. There isn't that much volume now. A lot of people seem to have gone to, to Facebook and so on, which yeah. uh, completely changes the, the dynamic. It is a, a, a medium of a communication that is very standardized, is going to probably is going to persist for a long time. And it's email that just flows into directories that you set up. And you can, you can find any thread, any subject if you save these things. There's, there's sites on the internet that have these emails uh, stored, uh, some of them in easily searchable and referenced things going back into the, uh, the early 1990s. And the wealth of information in there is just huge. Yeah, because there's discussion of, as, as Harold said, of 
you know, oil versus grease, but there's also looking for parts or trying to figure out how to repair something, especially in the series world. So that's a, it is a, it is actually a great resource. Oh, I've used the uh, LRO list as a reference source for writing articles for the OVLR newsletter for years. So if folks want to want to tre- check out the LRO list, we'll, of course, have a link in the show notes. You, you need to sign up and you get a monthly notification. I think you still get that, that you're on the list and you can set up a daily digest. That's, I usually get the daily digest, by the way. Yes, I'm, I haven't signed up for the list in such a <laughs> long, long time. time. I actually have. <laughs> you know, that's right, yeah. But we'll, yeah, we'll have a link if you want to check it out and go sign up for it. You can do that and you know, do like Harold and I do and kind of just lurk and listen in on, on the different conversations. I see Nick Danger occasionally will post something. Mark Love, those are people I know. It's also good for the birthday party, too, as that's coming up because a lot of those people are, are attending the birthday party. The simplest way to find the list is just type in LRO space list space four. <laughs> where it sits and you should get a page coming up that gives you all the information on how to subscribe to it and such like that yes and, and any of its sub lists i didn't actually realize there were uh, lists for other countries i just thought there was one lro list no the british one is currently uh quite active in comparison what kind of things do they talk about all the same stuff that uh they yeah. do in in north america i never understood the why you'd have Except for talking about events and so on. Though the delete key, if you don't care, makes it easy. But people like to have their own lists and things like that. Okay, so they exist for that. I assume they do they talk a lot more about defenders, I assume, than they would maybe series truck. I That's could, about the same. It's about, okay. So you guys, you uh, in Fourfold, which I think is not just you, host then oh, all, no. all these lists? That's right. Ben Smith down in New Jersey. That's There's a, another person to, for you to go and uh, chat with sometime. Yes, yeah, he's much more into Unix than I am. You know, he's the, the main person going and, and running the lists and making them all go. Thank you from the community for running those lists all these years. I'll I'll, I'll extend that thank you to to you for on behalf of everybody. Is that is that all right? Well, the the credit really goes to Bill Colosia, who set this up back in ninety two or ninety one thereabouts and kept the thing going all the way till a couple of years ago. You know, through his effort and creating the lists that. You started to get all the clubs to work together, popularize these events and such, because once that got going, it was just a sea change for the club scene. You had people from OBLR showing up at the Down East Rally when it was uh, going on. They'd come down to Mar, got you from Fort Pitt, people from you know New York, New Jersey, Maine, and so on coming to the birthday party. It made something that up till that point was essentially fairly local, if not maybe regional, into something that was certainly regional and almost you know taking over whole whole sections of the, the continent and so on, where the the northeast east coast people knew what was going on in the different areas, and if you had time, you could now go down and participate in these events, and it made a huge difference. Because people are able to communicate and exchange information, ideas, events, and so on, you know, over that mailing list. Didn't the list run off of a computer at Bill's house up until the day he died or something like that? Yeah, past the, the day he died, though we had a copy of it from beforehand. I, I vaguely remember some story about having to, to rescue the server from his house from his next of kin or something like that, and then they... Got it running. You guys, I guess, got it running after that. Uh, Bill had given us a copy of the archives beforehand, but it okay. ran it ran at his place uh, until uh, he passed away. And then there was the, the huge scramble to go and get the server because it had the latest information on it. But we were able to go and, and stand the list up uh, quickly using archived information. And then it was get the server to go and update everything and find the people that had uh, been missed and so on at that in that period of time between them. So you've also attended uh, and met up with uh, Morgan at the uh, Vermont. The, that British invasion. Thank you. <laughs> well, thanks, Morgan. It was a it was a brief meeting, but it was definitely good. That, that event's changed a lot. It used to be in a on a field off the road that goes up to the the notch and so on. And there was a, an RTV course there that was set up by Rovers North and so on. It was it was a very different event than what you see today. I, I think at the height there was it would get well over 100 Land Rovers, 120 Land Rovers that were appearing there before that side of it kind of collapsed. I would say that this past year was actually a pretty good year for Land Rovers 
at British Invasion has been growing the last number of years, but it, it has been pretty pitiful. <laughs> up until the early 2000s, OVLR used to, to show up there with a, a lot of people and vehicles from all over the place. It was almost kind of like a, they're hosting another OVLR event off to the side. We'd bring the uh, Club Expedition trailer down there and you know, serve ourselves food and so on. At the location in the, uh, the fields where it used to be, there was no issue with people camping out there. You couldn't do that today in the, the park downtown Stowe. But it's that true. made it uh, very accessible for uh, people to go camping and, and things there and made it you know very reasonable in terms of cost. But the British yep. Invasion has always been a, an interesting event to go to. One of many. There's there's a long list of events. Winter Romp is a, obviously another. Mars is interesting. It's you know for a huge event, though much more defender-oriented and so on. But uh, all of that, the exchange and so on of, knowledge and the rest was all coming through the the LRO list, which then was used by Sandy Grice, myself, or Jim Pappas, put into the newsletters, which were the primary means of communication at the time, using dead trees to the, the bulk of the memberships to say, hey, here's this rally. Maybe you want to go to it different and you'll have some fun. Oh, yeah. In the, the latest edition of the OVR newsletter, which you start to have started talking about something to me is fascinating is the Land Rovers and stamps. Right? One of my other boring hobbies is uh, stamp collecting, primarily line and grave stamps from early uh, England, the Victorian era, 1840s, generally 18, 1850s. But back and again on the LRO list, I and another uh, chap by the name of uh, T.F. Mills had a discussion about Land Rovers on stamps, and that started me going and looking and seeing, well, how many stamps would actually have a Land Rover on it? You know, there really can't be that many. And I'm past 150 now. Really? Wow. Oh, yes. Hmm. I was going to say it's far more than the instances That's... of Land Rovers on money. Uh, one. <laughs> one, yes. <laughs> I, I have, and I have a copy. Well, there's three versions of it, but uh, oh, different oh, colors and paper and so on. Right. Over the years, I've, I've collected all of these stamps. Some of them are, you have the, you know, there's, there's real legal stamps that were used as postage. You've got cinderellas in a sense that are made by a third party for a country you've got ones that are just blatant illegal stamps some that are made by revolutionary groups because they want the land but they're not going to be let in there there's just all sorts of things and then you know from series to defenders to range rovers to police vehicles military vehicles fire vehicles it was an interesting thing to do so it's probably going to be about a at this point 12 to 18 part series to, to try and get them all because there's just so many of them. Wow. And you can only fill in about two pages a, an issue of the, the newsletter as they do it anyway. I guess they're not all then British then. I assume there's they're all around the world? Oh, it's all around the world. Yeah. Any American stamps? No American stamps. Of course not. No Canadian either. <laughs> really? You, I would have, I actually am surprised to hear that. I thought there would have been a Canadian one. I think yeah. the the American stamps were crushed at the border. <laughs> they're not old enough uh you think no, grizzly torque and, would be a good a good opportunity to throw a uh a canadian land rover on a stamp there's no, a land rover was a good enough vehicle that the first land rover stamp was in 57 for a vehicle that came out in 48 hmm. and for the mother company rover the first rover appeared on a stamp i think in 1980 or 81 78 years after their first car whoa so took a while well, I think I think it helped Land Rover that the Queen is a fan. Oh yes, he's got a few of them, <laughs> and she doesn't need a driver's license. Little known fact: the only person in the UK without one. One of the things on the LRO list early on was the frequently asked questions that developed as people would always ask the same, you know, same questions: what kind of spark plug should I get? What kind of points or condensers and so on? And grease versus oil. Should I put oil in the swivel housing or grease? Yeah. <laughs> well, back then originally. The, uh, you didn't have the one-shot grease for the Range Rover at the time, so it was just put in your uh, 90 right, that was, that weight. Was, that was BMW's great gift. So there was a frequently asked questions that was email that got lengthier and lengthier as time went by until I took it over probably about 93. By about 95, we had put it onto a website, which eventually evolved into the OBLR website, the Land Rover FAQ website, and the rover web started off as the rover web. Now roverweb.org is where we're trying to go and collect all of the club magazines 
and newsletters and so on that used to exist in Canada and the United States in the past. And we're trying to PDF them all and put them up on that site. So they're there as a reference because we've discovered some clubs, Prairie Rovers being a, a perfect example, that even the editor doesn't have any copies of any of the newsletters that were produced through the in, in through the 90s and so on. Wow. And it's a situation for a lot of clubs of like, where are back copies of your newsletter? Well, no one kept any of them, which is unfortunate. That's unfortunate. A shame. Well, that's at the- least with OVLR, just about all of the 407 uh, newsletters we've produced since '84 are actually up online. Land Rover Owners Association of the U.S. We've got most of their newsletters up online. Alrox newsletters, a lot of them are up online. But as we're trying to go and find all of the old club newsletters and so we can digitize them, PDF them, and, and put them up so people can actually go and see what's, what's going on at the time. Because there's, again, they're a fantastic reference material because someone, of course, has written, a, written about grease versus oil at least four or five times, and you can go see who may have been had yeah. the, their act together on the subject. Now, that's all on the uh, OVLR website? Uh, the OVLR website is, the three of them are kind of linked, but they are separate domains. Okay. They all have a similar look and feel. The OVLR website's kind of red. LRFAQ is green. The base color and the rover web is uh, blue. But if one found themselves on the OVLR website, there would be be links to take take them elsewhere? That's right. Okay. They're cross-linked between each other. And if any of our listeners happen to have some of this old material that's uh, printed in these newsletters, what's the best way to contact you, or should they scan it in themselves? And then you know, email it if to they, you. If they, ideal, the best way to do it is to go and just if you can scan it, make a PDF of it, and send it to me at uh, dkenner at gmail dot com, and we'll get these things onto the rover web. Dead tree version. I, not many people probably want to mail packets of these things, but I guess in the show notes you can go and put an address or something down to go and mail them. But yeah, if they want to mail ideally, them, we'll c- contact you and we can figure that out. Yeah. Contact, put them in touch. Well, depending on what country they're from, that could be a good way to use a Land Rover postage stamp. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> or drive them. Go to the birthday party, bring your old uh, copies of newsletters with you, attend the well, birthday party, and hand deliver them. Well, the other way is another offshoot of the LRO list, the the land or the, the Rover Underground Railroad. Oh, R-U-R-R, yes. which tends to move parts up and down the, the U.S. C- Canadian coasts and so on and yes. back and forth. I have, we've have we've used ones. that ourselves. I guess that's an offshoot also of the R- LRO then, right? Because there was probably it communication. Was. Yeah. As a recent example from two years ago, hi, I bought a winch from Ike Goss out at Pangolin. I need to get the thing to the East Coast. Well, that winch went from Oregon down to Central California where it was picked up by another person who brought it to further to Southern California, where it was put onto a DC-3, flown to Florida, and then worked its way up the uh, coast to uh, <laughs> further north. What's the, the DC-3 better. connection? That's interesting. Yeah. One of the, a couple of the, the Land Rover owners, series Land Rover owners, uh, fly a, a DC-3. If you think that series Land Rover people are pack rats. We are absolute rank amateurs in comparison to some of the DC-3. <laughs> they use kiddie pools under the engines to catch the oil. Oh, oh wow. yeah. <laughs> and the parts are, you know, in a hangar, the parts just go to the, the roof. But uh, well, Yeah, because if you don't save the parts, you're making them next time you need them. Uh, there's still a lot of DC-3s flying. You know, they're right. the, the equivalent of a series Land Rover. The LRO list took a lot of small parochial clubs like Bay Street, OVLR, Rove, and so on, and turned them into much larger regional clubs and really got them working together. And you knew about events up and down the coast, and it really started people mixing. Uh, you know, that list was what really got it, it's what made uh, OVLR go from a club of probably, you know, 40, 50 people to I think at one point it hit nearly 300. Um, now it's down to 150 or something like that. The LRO list and, and what Bill Colosi and so on did was, you know, what was behind all of this. Yep. Connects and the, you just don't community. get the same thing from Facebook. 
You know, oh, try and find someone's not. post from two days ago. I would agree there. <laughs> yeah, brought the community together. It it made a community really in, in many ways because people were kind of isolated pri- previous to that. You probably would see a series truck drive by and you'd go out and follow them, and that's how you met another series truck owner. Now it's a little easier and has become easier thanks to the LRO yeah. list. Mm-hmm. And it's yeah, a, Fort Pitt. Fort Pitt grew out of uh, yeah. Scott Wickham. Uh, right. Russell Wilson and John Humphreys and so on being on the LRO list right. and showing up to the birthday party and so on. And the next thing you know, they created uh, Fort Pitt. Well, Dixon, thanks again for coming on the show. Thanks for what you've done for the community, especially here in North America and the LRO list and keeping it going. I know it's not just you, but you are the person we're talking to about it right now. And so I want to thank you for that. And thanks for coming on the show. No problem. And hopefully we'll see you uh, at the birthday party or maybe at another event. You, you, I know you get around to the events, especially here on the uh, East Coast. Our listeners can look out for Dixon and I'm sure you'll... Uh, provide them with some additional stories that you couldn't say in broadcast, right? Mm. <laughs> Especially when we start talking about borders. There we go. Maybe, maybe I tell you, what, how about this? Uh, if our listeners see you, they should buy you a beer as a thank you for sure. for what you've done for the Land Rover community. There we go. That's a good way to end that. Buy Dixon a beer. I th- there we go. That's... <laughs> Thanks again, Dixon. No problem. Bye-bye. And that's the Center Steer Podcast for March 2019. I want to thank Dixon for being our guest this month and also joining us for the news. So, Dixon, since you're still with us, thanks very much for coming on, talking to us about OVLR, the birthday party, and the OLR, OLR, the LRO list. Got lots to talk about. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, we did. Yes, we did. Thank you for the opportunity. Anytime. And hopefully you'll come back. I, did we did we pass the audition? I think you did. Yes, you did. All right. Hopefully. There's a lot of other things to talk about, too, in the world. Land Rover. Indeed there are. Indeed there are. And also thanks to Abel for his continuing help of the show by selling Range Rover winches. And a thanks to Pax, the one true Pax, for his continued production support, which should continue even though we're getting a new mixer. Visit our website, centersteer.com, to listen to previous shows and for show notes, which have links to our stories discussed in today's show. I remind you that we're part of the 4x4 Radio Network, and you can check out the other 4x4-related shows at 4 x 4 Radio network.com. You can connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can directly support the show at, fa- at patreon.com slash center steer. You can send us an email if you like to. If you're not a subscriber, please do so so you get the show automatically. It'll show up in your very favorite podcast app. And you can show your support for the podcast with a T-shirt or sticker through our website. Uh, there's a shop link on the website. And thanks to uh, Morgan and Dixon and Harold for coming on and joining us the show. Thanks very much, guys. Yeah, thanks well, for 10 having bucks me. is 10 bucks. <laughs> and uh, I remind you, uh, we'll be headed to Rovers at Wintergreen and also to the Sand Rover Rally. Stop, say hi, maybe even buy a shirt. <laughs> Help support the show. <laughs> Appreciate it around later in april there's going to be the uh, maple syrup rally up near ottawa that you could come on up to the second oldest rally in north america for land rovers birthday party is the oldest one and the birthday party is the june 21st this year's right that's correct mm-hmm. 21st 22nd 23rd i will make serious consideration of those two events also but that doesn't mean our listeners they can go also very true Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed show number 72. We'd love to hear from you and what you're up to in your Land Rover. Until next time, I ask you to share the show with one other Land Rover enthusiast. And you may now resume your important things. Kilometer, so it's the triangle of evil.